What's up, y'all? Thanks for being here, as always. Hope everyone is having a fantastic evening. Welcome to all of you that are in chat. As more people fill in, uh, if you end up going back and listening to this, welcome to you as well. Tonight, we're going to be addressing a rather common claim and narrative in the SDA world regarding why there are various denominations. This is actually a, a interesting topic within Adventism because on the one hand, like uh, Doug Batchelor, they'll want to tell you, no, 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 we're just another denomination like the rest of Protestants. But then on the other hand, like on the uh, talk tonight that Mark Finley gave over on his channel, they'll want to say, we're not a denomination. We're an end times group that God has called separate from the, the rest of all of that. So this is an interesting discussion for a number of reasons, as we will see. But this is also a topic where we get a glimpse into the restorationist roots of the Adventist pioneers that undergirds this particular claim, but really the whole system. Uh, to do that, I've enlisted the help of worldwide SDA church president, Ted Wilson. Last time our friend Ted gave us a hand was for the funeral service of Mrs. Ellen G. White. Ted, thank you so much for that. He was so kind to do the introduction, if you remember. And in that introduction, he exhorted us to read the spirit of prophecy for yourself. Don't take Pastor Bachelor's word for it or Pastor Wilson's word for it. So I want you to remember that tonight as well. This will be key. Remember. Sorry, folks. Had a little issue here on my end. Remember that, because that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take him up on his offer. But first, we aren't going to respond to the entire video, as this is already going to be a rather long stream. But as always, I like to state that from the outset, just so people know, we are simply going to be using Ted as an example, and responding to the entire thing will not be necessary to make our point. But before getting into that, I want to remind everyone that you can visit AnsweringAdventism.com, where you will find hundreds of primary sourced articles, responses to common SDA claims, memes, you can donate, you can partner with us, and a host of other things. This search bar is a great, great tool. You can type in phrases, you can type in text, like proof text, you can type in themes like contradictions, and you can come on here and you can browse to your heart's desire everything that's hyperlinked, you simply click on it. It'll take you right to the source yourself, and you can read to your heart's desire as much as you want, and then just hop right on back and continue reading to see that what we're saying is not us just talking out the side of our neck. And remember that every proof text or verse that is cited that is highlighted in bold, you can just hover, and it's going to show it to you right there. So please, folks, please, 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 please be utilizing these resources. We have all of these different topics and everything is organized and categorized. You can come in here. Articles are being added weekly, uh, daily. If I'm being completely honest, we're talking about 10 years worth of information that's been scattered throughout uh, physical materials that I have, notes that I've taken, a variety of things. And they're all getting put into this Q&A library, as well as, like I mentioned, a variety of other things, including the wall of memes. So please, 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 please be utilizing these resources as these are for you. That's why this exists. It doesn't exist just to dunk on Seventh-day Adventism. It's not just about, um, you know, doing this for the sake of doing this. Our goal here, folks, if you're an Adventist, our goal is for answering Adventism to not exist. I long for the day that answering Adventism does not have to be a thing that we can close shop and say, thank God he has put under his feet this enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ, his kingdom, his gospel. But until then, answering Adventism will exist. But again, I long for the day that it doesn't have to exist. So until then, this resource will be available and we want you to utilize it. I want to give a special shout out and thank you to all of those who have partnered with us financially. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys make this thing possible, and we are extremely grateful for your support. You're going to see some of that put to use here uh, shortly, not too long. should be uh, this month in terms of some of the content that you're going to see that that's going to fuel, but um, we're then going to be hitting uh, this, this winter. We're going to be hitting the uh, Google ad 
sphere, if you will, to start competing with the SDA church, which should be really, really fun and really, really good. Now, if you've never been an Adventist, you may not know how vital and foundational this specific topic is in the Adventist worldview. It's the bedrock of the us versus them mentality that many of the modern SDAs want to deny that exists. But the reality is, this is a key part of the system. It is part of the base structure foundation for their doctrines, like that they're the last day remnant, that, they're, that they uniquely possess the spirit of prophecy, something that they wrongfully define as we looked at in depth some weeks ago. But this topic is what props up the concept and idea of all denominations, except their own, as being a part of Babylon, which they attribute to doctrinal confusion and tradition, with themselves being the bastion of beacon and light, supposedly amidst all of the supposed theological chaos. So listen closely, Christian. Ted, we want to continue to take you up on your offer, like I said, to read the Spirit of Prophecy for ourselves. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Ellen White, in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 232. That's what we're going to look at here first. Adventist, your church upholds this as being a thus saith the Lord statement. Okay? What does she say? Quote, The term Babylon, derived from Babel and signifying confusion, is applied in Scripture to the various forms of false and or apostate religion. But the message announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to some religious body that was once pure and has become corrupt. Catch that. The term Babylon must apply to some religious body that was once pure, but's now become corrupt. It can't be the Roman Catholic Church, that's what she means by Romish Church, which is here meant, for that church has been a fallen con in a fallen condition for many centuries. But how appropriate the figure is applied to the Protestant churches, all professing to derive their doctrines from the Bible, yet divided into almost innumerable sects. The unity for which Christ prayed, what? Does not exist. Instead of one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4, there are numberless conflicting creeds and theories. Religious faith appears so confused and discordant that the world know not what to believe as truth. God is not in all of this. What is it, viewer? It's the work of man, the work of Satan. Protestantism is not the work of God. It's the work of Satan. Get that, viewer. Get that. She claims Protestantism is the result of the work of Satan. What an utterly ridiculous statement, but notice. Protestants are Babylon because they're supposedly divided into almost innumerable sects which show they're not one body and the unity that Christ prayed for does not exist amongst them. God's not behind it. It's the work of Satan. The irony of this statement will become more and more apparent as the evening goes on. Trust me, dear brother and sister, remember this statement because this is the bedrock for what we're going to look at tonight. Not the Bible as Ted's going to try and tell us, as Adventists are going to try and tell us, this is why the view is being projected into Scripture. So remember this. It's funny. On the one hand, Adventists will claim that Protestants are ecumenical stooges who have linked arms with the Papists. On the other hand, we're supposedly so divided that there's no unity whatsoever. It's the abject catch-22 that the SDA Church continually operates in. Like, which one is it? Make up your mind. Are we supposedly so overunited that we've overembraced, or are we so divided that there's no unity? <laughs> like, make up your mind, Mrs. and Mr. Adventist. But secondly, it's this topic of denominations that provide a perfect example of how the Adventist church has a target market of Christians. You have to understand this, folks. It's those of us that go to church on Sunday that they have labeled their biggest threat and enemy. How do we know this? Ellen White, same book, next page. Quote, When the churches spurn the counsel of God by rejecting the Advent message, she's talking about the 1844 Millerite message here, the Lord rejected them. 
The first angel was followed by a second proclaiming Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This message was understood by Adventists to be the announcement of the moral fall of the churches in consequence of their rejection of the first message, referring to the first angel's message. Supposedly this William Miller message that all these churches of the day were like, you guys are fanatics. This is not biblical. Well, that's supposedly by rejecting that God rejected them. She continues, the proclamation Babylon has fallen was given in the summer of 1844 as a result of about 50,000 withdrawing from these churches. So when they heralded this message and people left their Protestant churches and came and joined the Millerite church, that supposedly fulfilled Bible prophecy. So the second angel's message of the Adventist gospel was the announcement that Protestants and Roman Catholics are morally fallen due to their rejection of the first angel's message, which again was William Miller's imminent return of Christ message of 1844. Because Protestants of the day rejected their fanaticism, God then supposedly rejected them. But there are also supposedly, it was also supposedly a fulfillment of prophecy when 50,000 people listened and joined the Millerite movement. She continues. Sorry. In Revelation 17, Babylon is, re is represented as a woman, a figure, which is used in the scriptures as the symbol of a church. A virtuous woman represents a pure church. A vile woman, an apostate church. Babylon is said to be a harlot, and the prophet beheld her drunken with the blood of the saints and martyrs. The Babylon thus described represents Rome, that apostate church which has so cruelly persecuted the followers of Christ. But Babylon the harlot is the mother of daughters who follow her example of corruption. Get that. Babylon the harlot is the mother of daughters who follow her example. Thus are represented those churches that cling to the doctrines and traditions of Rome and follow her worldly practices and whose fall is announced in the second angel's message. Close quote. So Roman Catholicism is the harlot of Babylon and Protestantism is her whore daughters. Not my words, folks. It's in their words. This is what they don't want to lead off with in their revelation seminars and evangelistic efforts. But we're diving right on in. This is what they think about you, Christian. So don't let them try and pull the, we're just another Protestant denomination card or the, hey, brother, and try and cozy up with you. I'm not saying that the people themselves may not be nice people, but this organization is an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Catholics, Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East, Coptics, please do not associate this organization with Protestantism. Why is that? As if that statement wasn't enough. Quote, Letters and Manuscripts, Manuscript 51, page 25, 1899, 16 years before her death. Quote, Satan will excite the indignation of apostate Christendom. That's those of us that reject the SDA fanatic unbiblical theology. Satan will excite the indignation of apostate Christendom against the humble, the humble remnant, that's the SDA church, who conscientiously refuse to accept their customs and traditions, blinded by the prince of darkness. Popular religionists will see only as he sees and feel as he feels. They will determine as he determines and oppress as he oppressed. Liberty of conscience, which has cost this nation so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. The church and the world will unite, and the world will lend to the church her power to crush out the right of the people to worship God according to his word. Woo! She continues. Last Day Events. This is a compilation book but still in the same topic, the same vein. Last Day Events, page 132, quote, Laws enforcing the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath will bring about a national apostasy from the principles of republicanism upon which the government has been founded. The religion of the papacy will be accepted by the rulers and the law of God will be made void. Close quote. So all of us, those of us that go to church on Sunday, the universal church, this is going to be us, supposedly. She continues, Last Day Events, page 136. The whole world is to be stirred with enmity against Seventh-day Adventists. The whole world. Everyone's going to be focused in on the SDA, supposedly. 
because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday, the institution of the anti-Christian power. Continues, same page. Quote, the so-called Christian world is to be the theater of great and decisive actions. Men in authority will enact laws controlling the conscience after the example of the papacy. Babylon will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Every nation will be involved. The whole world. There will be a universal bond of union. One great harmony. A confederacy of Satan's forces. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Inserts a little snippet of scripture there. Thus is main manifested the same arbitrary op oppressive power against religious liberty, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, as was manifested by the papacy when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. She continues into page 147. The persecutions of Protestants by Romanism, by which the religious or by the uh, by which the religion of Jesus Christ was almost annihilated, will be more than rivaled when Protestantism and popery are combined. So Protestants are going to link arms with Roman Catholicism, which will eventually link arms with the whole world, and we're all going to be united in one bond of union as a confederacy of Satan's forces. Since Protestantism and Roman Catholicism are both his working, and we're all going to suppo supposedly rally up and hunt down Seventh-day Adventists to have them killed because they go to church on Saturday. Do not lump these people in with us. I'm going to say this repeatedly tonight. This is part of the reason why I started answering Adventism. Because I need to educate Catholics and Orthodox and all these other traditions just as much as I do Evangelicals and Adventists. Do not lump these people in with us. Do not point to them. I hear Roman Catholics sometimes point to this low-hanging fruit to say, see, that's the fruit of Protestantism. No, it isn't. Do not lump these people in with us. Do not lump this organization in with us. It is a separate thing. It is a separate thing. They do not like us just as much as they do not like you. Do not lump them in with us. But we're going to see how Satan sees, supposedly. We're going to see how he sees, feel how he feels, determine how he determines, and oppress how he oppresses. The same movement that will cry foul when you critique their theology. Just look at the comments in my videos. The amount of SDAs that think they're being persecuted because their theology is being critiqued. Yet they attribute murder to the hearts of Christians and claim it's from God. These are supposedly divinely inspired statements from the throne room of God. Give me a break. Give me a break. Yet the modern SDA wants to try and buddy-buddy up with you, Christian, and act like we're brothers and sisters. Understand, this is what this organization thinks about you. When the charade is removed, the fake piety extinguished, the theological fog is cut through, this is what the SDA church actually thinks about Christians. Over and against the evangelicalistic tactic of trying to act like we're a Christian family with the intent of converting you. Notice what she says here. This is Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, page 190. Quote, I saw, I saw, it means it's coming from God, folks. I saw that since Jesus had left the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and had entered within the second veil, this is the investigative judgment, the churches were left as were the Jews. That's us. And they've been filling up with every unclean and hateful bird. I saw iniquity and vileness in their churches, yet they profess to be Christians. Their profession their prayers and their exhortations are an abomination in the sight of God. Said the angel, God will not smell in their assemblies. Selfishness, fraud, and deceit are practiced by them without the reprovings of conscience, and over all these evil traits they throw the cloak of religion. I was shown the pride of the nominal churches, the irony. 
God was not in their thoughts, but their carnal minds dwell upon themselves. They decorate their poor moral bodies, talking about jewelry, and then look upon themselves with satisfaction and pleasure. Jesus and the angels looked upon them in anger. Said the angel, their sins and pride have reached up unto heaven. Their portion is prepared. Justice and judgment have slumbered long, but will soon awake. Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, saith the Lord. The fearful threatenings of the third angel are to be realized, and they will drink the wrath of God. An innumerable host of evil angels are spreading amongst them, spreading uh, themselves over the whole land. The churches and religious bodies are crowded with them, and they look unto the religious bodies with exultation, for the cloak of religion covers the greatest crimes and iniquity. Close quote. God supposedly showed her that he and all of the angels are angry with Protestants that rejected the silly 1844 message and the investigative judgment, which again is Protestants, Catholics, literally everyone except them. Essentially, everyone who rejects their message that bears the name of Christ. A one-size-fits-all, equal-opportunity offender kind of thing. The Christian Church Universal, which we're going to get into tonight. And we're who is in focus when God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Notice, not the world, not those professing, not, not those not professing Christ, the lost, those of us who profess Christ yet reject the SDA church's false doctrine and message. That's who the wrath of God is stored up for. Our prayers are an abomination. Evil angels have spread amongst us in our churches. This is why I do not take the bait when they try and play the victim complex game, folks. A common tactic with some of them. Don't take the bait. They love to play the victim and act like they're persecuted. Give me a break. This movement is definitionally an accuser of the brethren, the, the true Christian church. And that's why my tone is changing because I love the church. I love the body of Christ. I love believers. I hate false doctrine. And when people rise up like this that start accusing Christ's body, yeah, it offends me. It is hard-coded into the movement's DNA. The SDA church is an enemy of Christ in his kingdom, and it needs to be understood as such because they are professional ste uh, sheep stealers. They are a professional sheep stealing organization. And responding to talks like this one will be, we will be listening to tonight from Ted are a great teaching tool for the body of Christ to really see what's going on here. Now, I want to note, this message from Ted was an internal message meaning it was for those already in the system that have the worldview hammered into their mind already and understand a number of buzz phrases and themes that the average person listening isn't going to know the specifics and nuances of. So we're going to be breaking those down along the way. Now, he's going to say a lot, and we won't be able to address it all exhaustively. But remember, these quotes, as we listen, remember what we just read. Those are, thus saith the Lord's statements. Ted is on record, we've responded in video, to where he says, don't shy away from the spirit of prophecy. He exhorts, he's speaking at the annual council, which is two clergy in the SDA church. And he says, be on the lookout for people who are coming into your churches who are downplaying the spirit of prophecy, aka the writings of Ellen G. White. He said, even the apocalyptic, hard to like accept passages or quotes that she says, like the ones we just read. They uphold this. They believe this. Don't give me this nonsense that the SDA church does not uphold these things. Remember those quotes tonight, because that's going to be foundational to the whole thing tonight, because you're going to hear, we just believe the Bible. It's just the Bible. And you're going to see what's actually going on there. So listen with that in view. And remember the thesis. Why are there so many denominations? Why did Ellen say there were a ton of denominations? Because they're a tool of Satan. God's not behind any of it. And it's a confusion tool. It's what Satan is using to confuse people. But that's the question he's seeking to answer for the Seventh-day Adventist in this internal message. 
So when I interact with Adventists, you'll often hear me use the term the script. Tonight, you're going to hear a lot of the script. It is the standard fair SDA talking points that aren't actually rooted in fact, but in a worldview, namely the great controversy worldview. So with that in mind, let's get started here. We are one family in Jesus Christ. What a privilege to see all of you here. Those of you in the balcony, thank you for being here. Those of you here on the main floor, here in Indianapolis in the Warren Performing Arts Center. Indianapolis is a magnificent, well-known city all over the world. In fact, this weekend, it is really well-known. The Indy 500 will take place tomorrow. Exciting events. People are preparing. But the good news is, you are here today preparing for an event even greater than the Indy 500. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so notice, right out of the gate, he starts off with the, we are all one family in Jesus Christ, referring obviously to Adventists. Adventists are that one family in Christ. This is the setting of the stage for the focal point of his talk. That's what every SDA hears when they hear him say this. They're not talking about the pagan Sunday Christians. It's Adventists. But right out of the gate, belief and study of Seventh-day Adventism is how one prepares for the return of Christ. Notice that. You get the classic Adventist subtle dig at people who enjoy things the SDA church would call worldly, such as the Indy 500. Real followers of Jesus will be sitting in the Warren Performing Arts Center at the Seventh-day Adventist General Session to get further indoctrinated into the system and be told lies about Christians. That's how one is getting truly prepared for the Christ's return. Not by going to a car race. That's the sort of thing that's going on here. In Adventism, being born again, united to Jesus Christ, having union with Christ by virtue of his perfect work, holding fast to him as the only anchor that can weather the storm. Nope. That's not enough to be prepared for the second coming. Adventists love to talk about how, oh, we love the second coming. We're all about the second coming. Yeah, it's about more than just Christ's second coming. It's that they think their message is what prepares you for the second coming. That's what Adventist theology is supposedly for. It's to get people prepared for the second coming of Christ. And if you want to be ready, you have to come drink from the well of Adventist theology and fill yourself full to really make sure that you're ready. This is why so many Adventists, or, or, you know, Adventists and even former Adventists aren't even excited about the return of Christ, but burdened, weighed down, they feel inadequate, etc. But all of that to simply say, this is him setting the tone. Pretty standard tactic. Start with a joke or a general statement to drive your bigger point. In this case, Ted is setting the stage for what he is about to present. And that it's believing what he's about to present that will have someone ready for the return of Christ, supposedly. Praise God for every one of you, young people, those of you in the balcony here, and those of you receiving this by live streaming all over this globe, coming to you from Indianapolis in Indiana in the United States. Pastor Finley had a marvelous talk this morning, helping us to understand the final events and the coming of Jesus Christ. The understanding that his second coming, Christ's second coming, will not be a quiet event, it will be an audible event. It will not be something which will be unseen in a secret place, it will be seen by every eye. It will come with a shout, with a proclamation, with the trumpet of God. What a wonderful introduction to the topic that we're going to look at right now, which is to help us understand the lead up to this amazing Second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay. So in Ted and the SDA church's eyes, 
the reason they there are so many denominations is because of Bible prophecy. That is their pet obsession. Bible prophecy supposedly reveals that the reason there are multiple denominations is tied to the second advent of Christ. Think of this in light of what Ellen G. White said earlier regarding churches outside of themselves being fallen, which was a fulfillment of the first angel's message in 1844. People rejected William Miller's horrible hermeneutics and false date setting. He was a false prophet. His preaching of the imminent return of Christ was predominantly rejected, and according to Ellen White, God rejected them because of it. So when Ted talks about the second coming, understand, he is more specifically talking about the imminent return of Christ, not just the second coming, generally speaking. So all the denominations were rejected by God that rejected their fanaticism, and this plays into the idea for the SDA church as to why there are so many denominations. Their movement wants to be all about the second coming, so this is foundational to their movement. Remember, he said the reason there are so many denominations is a part of Bible prophecy. That's the thesis of his talk tonight. It was titled, Why Are There So Many Denominations? God has rejected all these denominations, including Roman Catholicism, Orthodoxy, uh, Assyrian Church of the East, the Coptic Church, the Marianite Churches, the Syriac Churches, all of them. Because they failed to listen to God's messenger, Ellen G. White, who was supposedly raised up, they love to say, like John the Baptist for the first coming, only Ellen was the messenger preparing the way before the second coming. So that's what's going on here. And since the imminent return of Christ is a non-negotiable in Adventist theology, meaning you can't believe the return of Christ would be far into the future, this is a gospel issue for them. Now he's going to break the ice on the topic at hand. So listen closely. The topic for this hour is one which a lot of people have questions about. Why are there so many denominations? What is it that fractures us and doesn't seem to pull us together? I'll tell you right now, this precious word, the written word, representing Jesus, the living word, pulls us together because it contains all truth. So this morning, as we focus on this subject, I want you to understand that it will all come from the Word of God. You know, have you ever kind of wondered if there's one God, one Bible, one Jesus, why is it that there are so many denominations, so many different groups in the world? In fact, <laughs> there are thousands of different church groups worldwide. Indeed, an individual might be very bewildered, confused about why there are so many churches. They don't really understand. One God, one Bible, one Jesus, but thousands of different churches? What is the answer to this question? Well, a bigger question is which one of these churches is the right one? Have you ever wondered, well, how can I really truly find the truth? We know from Scripture that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. So why are there so many denominations? Well, here's a secret. You do not go to a church to find out what truth is. You go to the Bible to find out what truth is. Then you find a church teaching in harmony with the Holy Word of God. So if you had to search the teachings of every single church, you'd probably be looking through thousands of denominations and different church groups. And that would take you a lifetime. And in the end, maybe you'd still be likely confused about conflicting statements from different churches. So never go to a church to discover what is truth. 
you go to the Bible. All right. So get comfortable, folks, because we're going to be camped out here for a minute. Because this sets the foundation for where he's going to go in the talk, and you want to have this information in mind to filter through what he is saying. So we get the standard SDA assertion and false proposition that all denominations supposedly view themselves the way the SDA church does. You got to understand this. Adventists think that all denominations view themselves the way Adventists view Adventism. They think all denominations think they're the one true church and you have to try and find the right one which is an impossible, laborious task that would just take a lifetime. And this is often said, as you'll see, to bolster the idea that the SDA church is one united monolith with no division, strictly based on the Bible, showcasing that they have the unity that Jesus said his church would have. They keep the commandments of God, therefore they're the one true church. And if you just read your Bible, you'll see this is crystal clear and obvious. Despite the fact that they make up 0.007% of the world's population, they're the only ones that actually believe the Bible. Everyone else doesn't, and that's supposedly why they're divided and possess no unity. They, they you know, and they're um, just completely confused like Babylon. That's the thinking and messaging, messaging here. This is simply not true, okay? Let's start by defining our terms. The word church, folks, has a semantic range, meaning that depending on the context that it's used in, it means different things. Ted is engaged in what's called the fallacy of equivocation, and it scrambles people's minds if you're not able to pick up on this. It's when someone uses a word or phrase in an argument to mean two or more things, but doesn't clarify the differences. So Ted will use the word denomination and call them churches, when he says, there's all these different churches out there. He means denominations when he says that. But then he'll use the word church that same way to try and say each one thinks they are the true church. The one true church. In which case he would be referring to the universal church, the body of believers, the Catholic church. Sorry, Adventists. That word just means universal. Not Roman Catholic, but Catholic. Now, I know that Roman Catholics are going to want to latch onto that and say, no, no, no. That's not the focus for tonight. But Ted is not clarifying his distinctions and equivocating the word church by using it in two different ways without distinction, which is the root of the whole issue. Every church, meaning denomination, does not think that they are the one true church. Now, what do I mean by that? There are three main ways that the word church is used. This is all three of them. Okay? First, you have the building. Pretty self-explanatory. Local buildings across the globe where various local expressions of the one body gather to conduct their worship services. There are multiples of these, obviously. Like when someone says, I'm going to church tomorrow. They're simply referring to the, they're using the term church to refer to the location that they're going to be going to gather with a local extension of the body of Christ. So it can be said used in that context, which leads us to the next usage, the body, the ecclesia in Greek, the called out ones. So this refers to the universal church both visible and invisible. I'll explain what that is meaning in a moment. This consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one under Christ, the head of the body, and apart from which there is no salvation. Whoops, sorry. This was set up by the Lord Jesus Christ, not man. The building was erected by a man. The denominations, by a man. The body was erected by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all people, both past, present, and future. 
who are united to Jesus Christ, the head, in all places, at all times. This is the one holy church. Rome, the East, etc. They're obviously going to argue this definition with classical Protestants. That's fine. Not the discussion in view tonight. This discussion is in the realm of Protestantism and SDA claims and assertions in light of that. Now, this is not to be confused with denominations. There is only one body, not two, three, four, etc. Only one. People attached to Jesus Christ by faith can be found in local Baptist churches, Lutheran, Presbyterian, etc. They're all, all united to the same God by virtue of the same gospel message, just like Paul speaks about in Philippians 1, 27 through 8. What does he tell us there? He wants to hear that they're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of what? The gospel. That's what unites Christians. Same God, same gospel. Baptists do not have a unique gospel. Lutherans don't have a unique gospel. The Dutch Reformed don't have a unique gospel, and so on. Real world example. I can go out and do street evangelism with Baptists and non-denominational believers, as I have for years, laboring alongside one another seamlessly for the same God and his gospel. Our differences around how we think the local church should be governed has zitter, literally zero bearing on that. Nowhere does Scripture elevate such a thing to be a dividing line. Nowhere does Scripture teach or present that if you disagree on that, you're wandering after a false god or a false gospel. We're on the same mission, given by the same Christ, to take the same gospel to the nations, furthering the kingdom of God, period. Same God, same gospel, same mission. But according to Ted, this shouldn't be the case. I shouldn't be linked arms with them because there's apparently no unity there since I'm a Presbyterian. That's the sort of messaging and positioning put forth by Ted in the SDA church. Yet the reality is, I'm far more united with them than they are amongst themselves. Just go look at this past week's video for Monday. Go look at the comments. You have professing Adventists arguing back and forth with each other on whether or not the movement and Ellen White are Trinitarians. They're not even united, folks, on who it is that they worship. Their local assemblies are filled with people united on diet, but not deity. Yet this is the movement that is completely in unity and everyone else is Babylon confused, silly pagans? Give me a break. The Adventist church is one of the most theologically confused worlds I've ever engaged in. And I've engaged with a lot of people, folks, out on the streets. Muslims, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Hare Krishnas, PETA, the, the, the animal rights group, atheists, Hindus, the list goes on. And I'm telling you, Seventh-day Adventism is one of the most doctrinally divided movements I've ever come across. What unites them is their great controversy worldview, meaning the way they see the world and the day that they go to church. That is what unites Seventh-day Adventists. Anything beyond that is a complete dumpster fire free-for-all. It is theological anarchy. Bible and me, under the tree, I don't need no history type stuff. And that's who Christians are supposed to yield the creeds to? We're supposed to believe Athanasius the Great was a clueless heretic? Ignatius was a pagan heretic? Ambrose Irenaeus was a pagan heretic? No, no, God wasn't leading these great gifts to the Christian church in the church's infancy as they stood against actual idolaters and actual pagans. No, no. Instead, he was supposedly behind a 19th century teenager who couldn't exegete her way out of a wet paper bag and her anti-Trinitarian cohorts who the church universally needs to be corrected by. Yeah, give me a break. This facade from the Adventist church is completely transparent if you've ever engaged with SDAs apologetically for more than, say, two minutes. The monolithic unity with everyone else being Babylon full of division and confusion is peak irony. Peak irony. Pot, meat, kettle. But finally, the third usage. 
This is what Ted has been equivocating between without distinguishing. The second usage and the third are not identical. Denominations are human organizational gatherings. So I'll hear Roman Catholics, for example. Sorry, Roman Catholic friends. I'm just using you as an example. They'll mockingly ask me, don't you realize, bro, that your church goes back to the 16th century? And they mer they're making the same error. That's because we don't believe only Presbyterians or insert whatever denomination make up the universal church. Obviously, I know the history of the Presbyterian denomination. <laughs> You're conflating denominational organization with the universal church. Denominations are simply visible local expressions of extensions of Christ's body where the word of God is preached, the sacraments lawfully administered, and the triune God is worshipped with his gospel being proclaimed. The word of the true God is preached, which is the gospel to the ears. It's believed in the heart and accepted by the hearer. That action by a lawfully commissioned bishop consecrates the elements of bread, wine, and water to be used for holy uses. You repent of your sins before coming to the Lord Jesus at his table to receive the gospel to the eyes and the taste by partaking of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and receiving the benefits of being united to him. Again, this is not contained to one single denomination, like the SDA Church so wrongfully claims regarding denominationalism. And quite honestly, it's a similar argument that Rome makes against Protestantism. So to be fair, they aren't alone in this by any stretch. Ted, if you want to critique Protestantism, then actually represent it accurately. As we're going to see momentarily, Ted's surface analysis here is really nothing more than rhetoric to rally up the echo chamber. So to, take, to, 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 to showcase what I'm saying here, let's look at a sampling of what could be considered Protestant confessions. Actual source documentation. Not Joe Schmo in the, uh, in the corner of the internet somewhere. Actual statements of faith. Let's see how divided they are from one another as it pertains to who makes up the body of Christ. Remember, Ellen White said, and this is a thus saith the Lord, they have no unity, innumerable sects. They're all completely divided and confused. Well, let's look at these confessions. Do they claim it's only themselves and no one else that's the true church? Do they all claim to have a distinct mission and message to take to the world that no one else does, thus that they're, they're divided? Is the mission the same across the board, etc.? That's the sort of question we're going to be asking. So first, let's look at the historic Presbyterian confession. This is my confession. This is what I align with personally. 1646 Westminster Confession of Faith. What's it say regarding the church? Chapter 25 of the church. First point. The Catholic or universal church, which is invisible and consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one. Under Christ, the head thereof, and is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So the term invisible is simply used to denote what we cannot see, which is people's hearts. We can't see who's attached to Jesus Christ, the head by faith. Only the fruit of one's life and profession. This is what James 2 is talking about, by the way. Two types of faith. You can look at the fruit of somebody's life and see that when they make a profession, based on not just what they're claiming, but their actual actions back up what they're saying. That's all we can see. So all of those that are united to Jesus Christ by faith, that's who makes up the one body of Christ. Again, those people are all across the board. Sorry, Adventists. Yep, some of them are in Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, etc. But notice, the framers of the confession did not claim that everyone except Reformed believers are lost, or everyone that's not Presbyterian is lost. It's simply that one has to be. It's simply that one has to be attached to Jesus Christ, the head. Heck, John Calvin and his Institutes. He goes to great length to explain that the individual Roman Catholic has to be distinguished from the Roman institution 
because true born again believers that are attached uh, uh, attached to Jesus Christ by faith are found in their midst. He even defends the Eastern Church, the, the very beginning of his, of his institutes, in response to Rome's anathematizing of them as schismatics. And he asks, on what grounds? Because they dared to question papal primacy? So if you're an Adventist and try and appeal to the reformers to support your guys' stance, don't. We do not have the same view as we're going to see shortly. Despite all the Christianese language they try to use to make it appear as such. But the confession continues. The visible church, which is also Catholic or universal under the gospel, meaning it's not confined to one nation, as before, like with Israel. It consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and of their children and is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house of the family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. So the visible church is simply uh, denoting what can be seen with the eye. Visible local expressions of Christians gathering. Amongst those bodies, you have a mix of regenerate and unregenerate people. Someone's not attached to Christ by faith by virtue of simply attending a local worship service. That's essentially what's being said here. But again, notice, united to what? Or united in what? The gospel. By virtue of which, you have to be united around the same God because it's his gospel. Presbyterians don't have their own gospel unique to them. That's why we can rightly recognize you don't have to be a Presbyterian to be a true Christian. You just need to be attached to Jesus Christ by faith. And apart from that, there is no salvation. The idea of rogue Christianity, this modern day idea, again, my Bible and me under a tree, I don't need no history, that type of stuff is totally foreign to the, the, the Bible and Christian history. Because you commune with the Lord Jesus corporately. You commune with him as his body at the appointed time to hear his word preached, consecrating the, 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 the elements and the sacraments, water, bread, wine, setting aside those ordinary means to then be used for holy purposes. After hearing the word preached, you confess your sins and approach Jesus at his table to commune with him and partake of him. That partaking of his body and blood is the visible sign of all the promises one receives by being united to Christ, which nourishes us, sanctifies us. It is the gospel, in essence, being applied to the eyes and the senses. I love the Eucharist. I could sit here and talk about this all night. And again, that phrase Eucharist, folks, it's, it just means thanksgiving. But nevertheless, that's why it then says, Under this Catholic visible church, Christ hath given the ministry, oracles, and ordinances of God for the gathering and perfecting of the saints in this life to the end of the world, and doth by his own presence and spirit, meaning he's present, it's not just a memorial Adventist. According to his promise, make them effectual thereunto. And again, I, I'm not going to spend all night going in on sacramental theology and whatnot. I could. <laughs> I love this topic. But I'm expounding slightly because as we move to these other confessions, I want you to see the unity that supposedly doesn't exist, according to Ted Wilson and co. But the sacraments were given to the church, not each individual, such that I can eat bread and wine alone and somehow partake of Christ. But then it says, oh, sorry. This Catholic church hath been sometimes more, sometimes less visible, and particular churches which are members thereof are more or less pure according as the doctrine of the gospel is taught and embraced, ordinances administered, and public worship performed more or less purely in them. The purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error, and sometimes have so denigrated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Nevertheless, 
there shall always be a church on earth, capital C, to worship God according to his will. So notice, the claim isn't that the one true church disappeared for centuries and needed restored. Don't appeal to that, Adventist, the, the reformers, to say, oh, well, we're just like Protestantism. No, you're not. But that one church, universal, can err because it's made up of humans. Rome's going to argue with that, obviously. This goes back to the arguments of the, the Protestant Reformation. Say a local church, uh, it's non-denominational, let's say. They can start off sound and allow damnable heresy to creep in Embrace it and no longer be a valid local expression. But that doesn't mean that the church, capital C, has disappeared. That local church has apostatized, but not the one holy church. There have been What this is saying is that there have been periods of more visible purity and times of less visible purity. But the purity has still been present on the earth since Jesus established it. The reformer's argument with Rome was how the term church or ecclesia is defined. Not that the gates of hell ever prevailed against the church. It was totally lost and then needed revived so that some people needed to rise up and, and take the torch and undergo such a task. Again, not to sidetrack into that tonight, but just so it's understood. Because I've heard I don't know how many Adventists over the years that try and ride the coattails of the reformers and claim we're just like them. When it comes to this, no, <laughs> most certainly not. So that's Presbyterians. Next up, some people may not even consider Baptists to be technically Protestant in the historic and formal definition. People often use it much too loosely to re Protestantism to refer to any group that claims to be Christian but isn't Catholic. So I'm using this tonight to show that despite that, even their statement of faith doesn't say what Ted is posturing. What do they say about the church? Quote, A New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is an autonomous local congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in faith and fellowship of the gospel. In the faith and fellowship of what? The gospel. Observing the two ordinances of Christ governed by his laws, exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. Each congregation operates under the lordship of Christ through democratic processes. In such a congregation, each member is responsible and accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ. Its two scriptural offices are that of pastor and elder and deacon, or pastor, elder, and deacon. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor and elder is limited to men as qualified by scripture. The New Testament speaks also of the church as the body of Christ, which includes all of the redeemed of all the ages. Believers from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Close quote. So here we see the exact same thing in principle and foundation that the Westminster Confession said. They simply added in their church governance differentiator. into They, they included that into the statement. That a local New Testament church is an autonomous local congregation. But that differentiator from Presbyterians doesn't make them idolaters wandering after a false god and a false gospel. Again, a valid local church is one where the word is preached, the gospel heralded, which means include the, included the true God, and the sacraments are lawfully administered. What does it say that they're seeking to do? Advance the gospel to the ends of the earth. The exact mission Jesus left the disciples with in Matthew 28, take the gospel to all nations, not some present truth, distinctive special gospel message that they supposedly got insight into from, the from a 19th century prophetess, 
who butchered not Revelation 14 to try and claim it's talking about some end times, special, unique gospel message that only they have to take to the world. No. The same gospel in view here is the same gospel mentioned back in the Westminster Confession. They state that the body of Christ is all believers in all times, every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That's who makes up the one universal body. Nothing about it being only Baptists. Nothing about it being united with other, uh, not being united with others who believe in and worship the same God and believe his gospel. And for all the Adventists who think they can pin this on their favorite boogeyman of Calvinism, this isn't a Calvinist confession. That's got nothing to do with what's in view here. I'm as united with a Southern Baptist on who God is and what the gospel is and the mission of the universal church to take that God and gospel to the ends of the earth. We've got the same foundation. We differ on systematics. And if you want to play the that's ecumenical, Sure, <laughs> I'm ecumenically united to any person that is united to Christ by faith as the universal Catholic Church. Catholic Church. Sure. Next up, Classical Anglican Confession, 1571, 39 Articles of Religion. What do they say regarding the church and our unity? Quote, The visible church of Christ is a congregation of faithful men in which the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments are duly administered according to Christ's ordinance in all those things that of necessity are requisite to the same. As the church of Jerusalem, Alexandria, and Antioch have erred, so also the church of Rome hath erred, not only in their living and manner of ceremonies, but also in matters of faith. Close quote. Again, they say, a valid, visible expression of the Christian church, the one body, is one where the pure word is preached, the sacraments are lawfully administered, and it's done by qualified bishops. Not that it's only Anglicans, and they think they're only the one true church, meaning they themselves are the universal church in tota. They affirm the same gospel, the same God as the rest of us. Next up. My Lutheran friends, of course I have not forgotten y'all. 1520, Augsburg Confession, Classical Lutheran Confession of Faith. What does it say? This is from the Book of Concord. And they teach that only, that, that one holy church is to continue forever. The church is the congregation of saints in which the gospel is rightly taught and the sacraments are rightly administered. And to the true unity of the church. Okay, what do they talk about here regarding unity? Remember, Ellen White said they have no unity, these people. And to the true unity of the church, it is enough to agree concerning the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. Nor is it necessary that human traditions, that is, rites or ceremonies instituted by men, should be everywhere alike. As Paul says, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, etc. Ephesians 4. Again, a valid, visible local church is one where the gospel is rightly taught and the sacraments are lawfully administered. And where does it say that the unity of the church universal lies? Agreement upon the gospel, who God is, the administration of the sacraments. And the Lutheran framers even tacked on that tradition is not a dividing wall, for obvious reasons, historically. The gospel here is not any different than we've seen mentioned in these previous confessions. They are all referring to the same message, the same God who gave it, etc. They all agree on what the church is, what makes a valid, visible extension of that body, etc. Now, I could go on and on and on showing more Protestant confessions. Say, compare the rest of the Anglican 39 articles to the Westminster Confession of Faith, to the Congregational Savoy Declaration, to the 1689 London Baptist Confession, to the Dutch Reformed Belgic Confession. Over 90% of the doctrine is essentially identical. <laughs> not even, not just the chapters on the church, 
the whole document. So Ted is either one, ill-informed, which is unacceptable for his level of notoriety, or two, dishonest. Because what he said previously is historical revisionism, and it's outright false. Mr. Wilson, I guarantee you, guarantee you, that we have more unity than you guys do amongst your small world of Adventism. Especially if we did our sampling per capita. These guys don't even realize, folks, born-again Christians, they don't care about denominations, really. Like, it's not that big of a deal. I was just talking with a friend of mine about this the other day. It's like, dude, we don't care about that. I'm not trying to convert my Baptist brothers to be Presbyterians when I hang out with them or do evangelism alongside them. I mean, heck, there are people in my local church who aren't even Presbyterians in terms of the formal sense. They simply love Christ, they love the gospel, and want to worship and labor alongside like-minded believers. They don't know a lick about systematic theology. They're just like standard fares Christians that love Jesus and serve him. We're on the same page on the fundamentals. And being Presbyterian is irrelevant at that level. There's something that transcends that label. There's been Roman Catholics I've been standing outside the abortion clinic with who we talk. And I'm like, dude, I don't care about your label now because I've asked you these questions. And at the end of the day, I don't care about that. There's something that transcends that. You don't have that with Adventists. We may differ on secondary doctrinal matters, but we've got far, far more common, far more in common than we do not. But see, in Adventism, there is no such thing as secondary doctrines. Everything is a foundational div dividing line. Yet, we all, Protestants, affirm the historic Christian creeds. We worship the same God. We've got the same gospel. We have the same mission to take that God and his gospel to the world. We worship together on the same day in different locations, commemorating the same thing. The new creation being inaugurated by Jesus Christ by virtue of accomplishing the work of redemption, seeing from that work and entering into his mediatorial rest as our high priest king. Doesn't matter if they're in Latin America, France, Portugal, Baptist, Moravian, non-denominational. So if you're coming out of Adventism and you're struggling with this issue, which I know that many are, do not take the bait. This whole thing is predicated on a faulty premise that the SDA church has to have in order for their system to work. It is literally built on equivocating our church and using it in two different ways without distinguishing to try and paint the picture that, oh, there's no unity amongst them. They're completely divided. But now I want to look at the SDA church's fundamental beliefs in light of all of that. So let's start with fundamental belief number 12. The church. What do they say? Quote. The church is the community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In continuity with the people of God in Old Testament times, we are called out from the world and we join together for worship, for fellowship, and in, or for instruction in the, in the word, for the celebration of the Lord's Supper, for service to humanity, and for the worldwide proclamation of the gospel. Oh man, it sounds pretty good. The church derives its authority from Christ, who is the incarnate word revealed in the scriptures. The church is God's family, adopted by him as children. Its members live on the basis of the new covenant. So we get lots of Christianese here and modeling of the wording based on historic Protestant confessions. Adventists love to to, to point to this vague general phrasing here and say, see, we're just like you guys, brother. We believe the church is the community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We don't believe it's only us. But once one parses through all of the Christianese and you understand how things are being defined, like we're going to look at, you'll see this isn't what's being said. <laughs> Remember all those quotes we looked at from their divinely inspired prophetess earlier? 
Remember, the SDA church upholds those statements as from God himself and completely in line with scripture. So understand this statement in light of those things that we looked at earlier. So they start by defining the church as those who are called out from the world and, quote, we join together for worship. Who's doing that with SDAs? They say we, referring to themselves. Are they doing that when the rest of us are, are doing that? Of course not. They don't consider our worship valid. It's apostate, pagan, Roman Catholic in origin, etc. So do not be fooled. They're not saying the same thing regarding the universal church like, like we saw in those other confessions. The church in Adventism is Adventism, period. Just like the Protestant confessions, they try to use the same barometer, the preaching of the word, the Lord's Supper being administered, and the worldwide proclamation of the gospel. So see, they're just like Protestants, right? Except folks, you know. If you've spent any, even a fraction of time on this platform, you know what they mean by the gospel. They're not heralding the same gospel the Christian church is. They're not meeting the same time we are. They don't have the same mission we do. They don't, they don't mean the same message that was in view in the Westminster Confession, the, the 2000 Baptist faith and message, etc. They mean their present truth only for a special people at the end of the, at the end of time gospel that they and only they are preaching. Which, by the way, is a thrice cursed by God message, according to Galatians 1, 6 through 12. We looked at this last week for probably the umpteenth time. If you haven't seen it, go watch the video on present truth and identity crisis. While you're at it, go watch the Gospel of Adventism playlist that we have on our channel. Watch the open mics from a couple weeks ago. We have gone over this repeatedly and will continue to for years to come. This movement is simply leeching Christian terms and using the same language, but they mean something totally different. And then they'll try and saddle Protestants with the same behavior. They'll claim, it's the exact same wording as Protestant confessions, bro. You're straining at gnats and nitpicking. Except no. The Westminster Confession, Baptist Faith and Message, Augsburg, etc., they mean the same thing when they say the gospel. They're not talking about various unique messages each denomination has. We're talking about the same gospel, the one revealed by Jesus Christ to the apostles that's been handed down to us today to take to every tribe, nation, tongue, and people. The SDA church, on the other hand, has completely redefined the words, which is the problem. They're saying the right words, but meaning something entirely different. They do this constantly because everything for them is defined by the means of the great controversy theme. Another thing we've looked at over and over and over again. Again, go watch that Adventist Gospel playlist if you haven't. I go into all the source materials there. But they do this constantly. Trinity, Gospel, Sola Scriptura, Jesus, and so on. You have to scale the language barrier, folks, if you're going to do apologetics with the SDAs. This movement is very good at copywriting and using all the same lingo to appear like the rest of us, and they are not. They're not united with those of us who worship on the first day, or those of us who are heralding the true God and His Gospel. They are against that which we very clearly saw from Ellen White earlier. But then they continue. Quote, The church is the body of Christ, a community of faith of which Christ himself is the head. The church is the bride for whom Christ died that he might sanctify and cleanse her. At his return in triumph, he will present her to himself a glorious church, the faithful of all the ages. Notice that the faithful of all the ages, we'll get back to that in a moment. The purchase of his blood, not having spot or wrinkle, but holy and without blemish, close quote. Now they're going to put more skin on the bones in the next section, but take notice here. They tack in similar language regarding the universality of the church. Those that are attached to Jesus Christ, the head. But as you're going to see, when we look past the service level, 
presentable presentation of the fundamental belief and actually go into their explanation of it, something very different is in view. The faithful of, of all the ages means something very specific, and it plays into the whole narrative that the universal church went completely apostate after the time of the apostles, and the true church was this small, virtually unknown group of people that one can hardly find anything about in history that was supposedly upholding the seventh-day Sabbath and all this sort of stuff. That's what's ultimately going on here, as you're going to see. Because what's connected to this belief is number 13, which is the remnant and its mission. Quote, the universal church is composed of all who truly believe in Christ. Again, folks, this is just the fundamental belief on the surface. On their website, you're going to see, you can click into each belief and they expound upon it, which is what we're going to do. So this is, SDAs love to point to this and say, see, you're, you're, he's making stuff up. He's a liar. They don't know what they're talking about. Yada, yada. The universal church is composed of all who truly believe in Christ. But in the last days, a time of widespread apostasy, a remnant has been called out to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Using the wording of the King James rendering there specifically of Revelation 12. This remnant announces the arrival of the judgment hour, a.k.a. the investigative judgment, proclaims salvation through Christ, a.k.a. the sanctuary doctrine, and heralds the approach of his second advent. Ah, just like, like Ted mentioned earlier, remember? All of Adventism has to do with being prepared for the second advent, which is their three angels gospel message, which is what they say here next. This proclamation is symbolized by the three angels of Revelation 14. It coincides with the work of judgment in heaven and results in a work of repentance and reform on earth. Every believer is called to have a personal part in this worldwide witness. Close quote. Ah, so the universal church is indeed composed of all of those who truly believe in Christ. But, remember, I've said this before, everyone loves a good but. In these last days, there is widespread apostasy, so the true church is a remnant of people called out from all of that, a.k.a. the universal church is Babylon. The remnant, the true church, is the SDAs. They're the ones supposedly keeping all the commandments of God in accordance with Revelation 12. They have the writings of Ellen G. White, which is supposedly the spirit of prophecy. So therefore, they're what the Bible is talking about. Now, there are so many erroneous assumptions regarding that. And if we were to address all of it, we would be here all night. The reading of themselves into a book that was written in the first century to an audience of that time that didn't have chapter and verse divisions. What we call chapter 14 or chapter 12, that actually had no application to that generation, that time. No, no, no. It's about some people far off into the future, the Seventh-day Adventists. No. It's not about some special group of people that so badly want to read themselves into the Bible nearly 2,000 years into the future that arbitrarily through wonky exegesis and mental gymnastics try and make 1844 some giant turning point of the end times. Read Hebrews 1, folks. Adventists, you love going to Acts, you know, Acts where, where Peter quotes Joel. Ironically enough, that's where I'm at with, with my family and family worship. I thought about this. It's actually today, this morning. You always want to jump there and say, see, it's talking about the last days and eh, go to Hebrews 1. There's, there's more places that the same, the same thing is referenced. The last days was here long before 1844. First few verses of Hebrews 1. Notice how the author uses the phrase the last days and when he applies it. I'll give you a hint. It is not 1844. That's for sure. But back to the fundamental belief. This is now where their unique gospel message is woven into the frame. So when they say worldwide gospel proclamation back in belief 12, this is what they mean. Their third, their, their three angels gospel message that they claim is all found, you know, in Revelation 14, 6 through 12. It's a present truth message that no one else in history proclaimed. Not the apostles, not the church fathers, not the reformers, not the medieval fathers. Nope. Only them. They state this repeatedly in their own publications, as we've shown over and over and over again. They say, 
every believer is called to take part in this worldwide witness, AKA it's only our church that's spreading this message around. So by believer, what they, they actually mean is seventh day Adventists. That's who a true believer is. See what I'm saying? My never been seventh day Adventist listener. Even the term believer here implies seventh day Adventist, not Baptist, not Presbyterian, not Lutheran. No. They aren't heralding this supposed, they're, or they're heralding the supposed end times gospel message. And Baptists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, they're not heralding that. Now, like I mentioned earlier, once you get past the service level presentation of the blurb, that is the fundamental belief on their website, you can click into each one and see a fuller explanation, which is essentially a summary of each belief with much of the information pulled from their Seventh-day Adventist Believe 28 Fundamental Beliefs book, which I have back on the shelf right there. So let's keep fleshing this out, shall we? Under belief number 12, under the heading titled, What the Church Will Be Like Near the End Times, it says this. As the world descends into turmoil as things get closer to the second coming of Christ, the church will be God's faithful people who hold on to his teachings. That is a key. Even while the rest of the world distances themselves from God, those in God's church remain faithful to him. They will hold out as holy among the wickedness of the world. Then they quote Revelation 14, 4. It's those who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed for mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. We're told that Jesus will present the, ch uh, the church to himself in splendor, Ephesians 5, 27, when he returns to earth, close quote. So they claim the church will be God's faithful people who hold on to his teachings. Again, on the surface, most Christians will hear this and think, yeah, I agree. Except what they mean is, like I mentioned earlier, the true church is a small pocket of virtually unheard people down through the ages who believe the seventh day Sabbath like the Adventists. Because if you don't agree with their butchering of the fourth commandment and Judaizing, you're not faithful to God's teachings. Thus, you're not a part of the church. They love to try and appeal to the Waldensians, for example, <laughs> to try and point to someone in history that looked like them. That's because this is what Ellen White so erroneously asserted in the Great Controversy, which the White Estate even had to admit, and they quietly, they quietly added a note about it in the appendix, which essentially says, well, when they used the term Sabbath, they didn't mean the Seventh-day Sabbath, but we do have some accounts of them worshiping with some Jews periodically. So that's good enough. Go look at it for yourself, folks. Go to the chapter of the Great Controversy on the Waldensians. Look at it. They added that. That's what's in the notes. Well, we know that. Eh. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to appeal to my spiritual ancestors. We have an article breaking all this down on our website, by the way, for those that are curious. Just type in Waldensians into the search bar up top and it'll pop up. No, Adventists. The Waldensians always were and still are Calvinists. They uphold the 1559 Huguenot Confession. It's a Presbyterian Calvinist confession. It never ceases to amaze me. For those that do not know, the SDA Church loathes Calvinism. I mean, absolutely despises it. Yet when they need a favor from history... They don't mind writing the coattails of those that they loathe to try and bolster their narrative. They do this with Roman Catholicism too. Anytime Rome says something that the SDA church thinks helps their case, they're all about it. See, Rome even agrees they changed the Sabbath. Except no, Mr. or Mrs. Adventist. They're not saying what you guys claim. You're committing word association fallacy. Rome will be talking about apostolic succession. And that the apostles, the apostles instituted worship on Sunday. Then they'll say Protestants have no basis for worshiping on Sunday because they don't go back to the apostles. Because Rome claims that the apostles were Roman Catholics. So if you break away from them, you have no basis for worshiping on Sunday because the apostles made that change and you're no longer attached to them. Make sense? They believe, Roman Catholics, that the apostles were Roman, the first Roman Catholics. 
And so they believe that the apostles were the ones that instituted worshiping on the first day. So if you break away from Roman Catholicism, therefore, you're not attached to the apostles and you have no basis to worship on the first day. That's the claim. That's what's going on in these statements that the SDA church loves to try and point to, to say, see, they even admit what we teach. Except again, no, Mr. and Mrs. Adventist. They aren't saying hundreds of years after the apostles, the papacy rose up usurping the law of God and yada, yada. But all that to say, what the SDA church means by the church is themselves. They are the ones supposedly faithful to God because they keep his commandments. Which really just means I go to church on Saturday. Everyone else is supposedly in disobedience, rebelling against God, and is lost. That's what they teach. Anyone saved outside of their band is saved in ignorance. It's because they're ignorant of the truth that the SDA church has, but God's only going to judge them based on the light that they currently have. So that's how they're going to try and weasel around the fact that they do indeed teach that they alone are the true church. Now, under fundamental belief number 13, when you click under the, the, the fundamental belief itself on their site, under a heading titled, The End Times Remnant and Who Will Be a Part of It, notice, quote, Those who are part of this remnant are recognizable by the way they choose to obey God's commandments at all costs, pledging themselves their allegiance to him and turning away from sin. The Apostle John, the last of Jesus' disciples and the one who wrote Revelation, tells us exactly who Satan will target. Satan's goal is to harm those who keep the commandments and believe what Jesus taught. But among the lawlessness of the corrupt world, God will call for his devoted followers to separate themselves from those who have rejected him. Close quote. So the remnant are those who choose to obey God's commandments, a.k.a. go to church on Saturday. Even though that isn't actually enough, you have to have the three angels' messages, the spirit of prophecy contained in Ellen White's writings, like we saw with Dr. O a number of months ago. But nevertheless, you disagree with the SDA church's faulty understanding of the Sabbath? You're not part of the true people of God. Doesn't matter how much scriptural evidence you can point to to the contrary. Ellen White said it. That's precious light from the throne room of God. Her, inter her interpretations of scripture stand, and that's that. Then we get a glimpse into the SDA victim complex and where it stems from. It's stuff like this. When Revelation talks about the devil making war with the woman, that's obviously the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Again, reading themselves into the Bible. Never mind the first century audience Revelation was written to. No, no. That's irrelevant to them. John was talking about Seventh-day Adventism. And October 22nd, 1844, which was supposedly the turning point into the last days. Where the gospel, you know, arbitrarily became, you know, the gospel at that point arbitrarily became the last day present truth message that a bunch of fanatics coming out of one fanatical movement after the next were given by God through a 19 year old who had mental health complications due to being hit in the head with a rock at nine years old. That's totally what John was referring to. Satan is supposedly focused in on the SDA church because they go to church on Saturday. Remember the stream from a few weeks ago for those that saw it. Responding to Mark Finley on the Sabbath and why Christians go to church on the first day. Where he kept imagining, which was actually him paraphrasing Ellen White literally like almost verbatim. My, I see in my imagination. No, you don't. You're literally just regurgitating Ellen White's writings as we show in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. But she claimed that Satan held a diabolical council meeting in the back alley of outer space somewhere to figure out his with his minions how he could attack Seventh-day Adventists for going to church on Saturday. True story. Go check it out. That's what she says, and that's how Mark Finley says it. He says, in my imagination, I see... Satan holding a diabolical council in outer space. What? We just believe the Bible. Yeah, okay. But here we see yet again, more of this fear mongering and scripture twisting. Satan persecuting the woman has nothing to do with the Seventh Adventist Church. They don't keep the commandments. They're idolaters. 
They have a false God and a false cursed gospel. Period. End of story. Give me a break. Don't keep the commandments. You guys violate the second commandment more than almost anyone I've seen, other than the Mormons. You're constantly making images of a person of the Godhead. Give me a break. They also mention that God's calling his people to separate themselves from those who've rejected him. To really understand the fullness of this, remember the Ellen White quotes from earlier. Part of the SDA church's call is to come out of Protestantism into Adventism. You're in Babylon and need to leave and join them or you're going to get the wrath of God poured out on you. Those in Protestantism have supposedly rejected the SDA gospel and teachings, so God has rejected them, which is what Ellen White claimed. So they're calling you, whoever you are, to leave and join them, the true church. If you don't do this, well, you just aren't a true follower of Christ. You love your sin. You disparage the idea of obedience, that sort of thing. Because God's true people will supposedly hear the Adventist message see the truth of it, and come join them. We see this very clearly in the next paragraph, where it says, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of, talking about Babylon, my people. Lest you take part of her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered their iniquities. Those who do not come out of the wickedness of the word, which that's a spell issue on their website. I just typed it as it is. I'm pretty sure they mean world. Those who do not come out of the wickedness of the world will be subject to the same fate as Satan. Utter destruction. Utter destruction. God refuses to let sin go on forever, and those who hold on to sin will have to account for their deeds. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Again, people are going to hear this and say, well, of course. Any person that holds on to their sins, right, right, right. But God's remnant people are, are not supposed to just hide in holes as they separate themselves from the world. God has a job for who? His people to do. A message they will deliver. For many people, this message will make the difference between eternal life with God and the permanent second death. All who hear it, this is the Adventist message, folks, will have to make a single vital decision either to follow God or side with Satan and share his fate, close quote. Sorry, I forgot to click over to the, the last part there. So if you hear the Adventist message, you have an option, you have a choice to make. Either accept it or you're going to be completely lost. But those that don't hear it, of course there'll be people that are saved that aren't Adventists. This is what they mean. They, they, they're saved in ignorance. It's because if they were part of this present truth time, meaning they lived post-1844 to the second coming, if they heard the message, they'll be accountable for rejecting it and be lost. But if they never heard it, well, they can still be saved in ignorance. Remember how Ellen White defined Babylon, Catholic and Protestant churches. Sorry, church in the East, Coptic, Syriac, Maronite churches. You guys get to miss out on the fun. But they cite that verse of Revelation, bringing with it all their assumptions as if no one else before them knew about this verse or understood it. And claim if you don't come out of that, that wickedness, you'll be, the, you'll be a subject of the same fate as Satan. Utter destruction. And God has a job for who? His people. Who are his people? The Seventh-day Adventists with their three angels gospel. That's the message God supposedly has for his people. The Adventist God, anyways. And they say that this message will make a difference between eternal life and damnation for some people. Any person who hears it will have to make a vital decision. Follow God, a.k.a. accept their message, despite it being absurdly false, or you're siding with Satan. Remember a few weeks ago during the open mics, for those that those of you that saw it, one of the SDAs that called is asked, or the one of the SDAs that called in asked, wait, you think we teach if you don't believe these doctrines, you'll be lost? He asked that to a slide that I had up that listed out the pillar doctrines of the Adventist gospel. 
He wanted the wanted to act like the SDA church doesn't teach that. Here you go, friend. Your movement states this over and over and over all over the place. Your prophetess, that's who the movement's getting its marching orders from, is found saying over and over and over again the same thing. Don't act like I'm making things up out of thin air. I'm just a mocker and a scoffer, etc. It's right there. Yes, you guys teach that your novel gospel became the gospel that people are now accountable to in 1844. If a person hears it, rejects it, they'll be lost. Salvation only exists for those who die in ignorance of this present truth message during this present truth time. Because every generation supposedly had their own present truth they're accountable to. All various gospels throughout the history, different gospels, total theological dumpster fire. So, Adventists, please do not give us this nonsense that you guys are just another Protestant denomination. Be honest. Stop playing word games and trying to buddy-buddy up with us. We are not brothers and sisters in Christ. I would love to be. I would love to be. But if you're holding to the teachings of this movement, nope. There is a wall up. You're not my enemy, but you're not my brother or sister. And the word games are old. Own up to your belief. Stop trying to play both sides. You guys think that we are in grave danger. We think you're in grave danger. One side is willing to own it, me. The other wants to play ring around the rosy and dance around the facts. Own it so that we can have an honest dialogue and not waste 45 minutes going around in circles where you try and play the, we're just like you, brother. No, not going to happen. So, I know that was a lot. I gave you a fair warning <laughs> that we were going to be camped out here for a bit. But the rest of what Ted is going to say needs to be understood with all of that in mind. So, one, the church is not a bunch of divided, non-unified, confused people who all have different gospel messages and you have to try and find the right one. That's not at all what's going on regarding denominationalism. Maybe sometime we will do a stream specifically dedicated to the history of denominationalism and dive even further on that. But nevertheless, Ted and the SDA Church are wrong to claim this. Especially considering they are the ones rife with division and arguing at the most basic level. <laughs> the Adventist Church, too, defines themselves as the true church and everyone else is apostate, even if they want to try and play word games and dance around the fact. It is hard-coded into the system. They are definitionally accusers of the brethren. I just had a lady commenting on my video videos yesterday. You can always tell the person who's new that ends up on the channel. I always say, you know, welcome, thanks for being here. But you can always tell because they go on a spree. You know, you, you get like 15 notifications from them where it's like, okay, clearly you just found the channel. She said, it's very telling. The SDA church never attacks other churches like this guy does. Give me a break. Give me a break. What are you talking about? It's literally hard coded into the system. Yet you turn it inward and all of a sudden, oh, we're victims. Whoa, we're persecuted. No, you're not. Your theology is being critiqued. If that's how persecution is defined, you guys are the biggest persecutor of Christians in the world. It's literally hard-coded into the system. Don't give me that. But then three, the, the third point with all that. They very clearly believe the unique message they possess is the mission God has for his people, aka them, to take to the rest of the world. So when their fundamental belief, number 12, says the church is united in taking the gospel to the world, they mean the SDA church is united in taking their novel message to the rest of the world because they believe they are God's true people. So remember all of that in going forward. I know we haven't listened to a lot yet, but that's because we're setting the stage here for you to understand what he's going to say moving forward because he's going to be using just general terms. But understand, what he is defining these things as is in accordance with the SDA church, which is ultimately defining it based on Ellen White's commentary. His whole talk is predicated upon this erroneous assumption and claim regarding denominations. Yet it's not even true, not in the slightest. 
Mercy. We're only five minutes in and the rest of the sections. <laughs> the rest of the sections, folks, will not be as long as this. But again, laying that out was pertinent. So with that said, let's continue. Now, you'll recall we have used this before. I'd like you... In fact, you sounded really good. Pastor Finley got you involved in reading right from the screen. I'd like you to read this with me, all right? Let's begin. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. So the Bible is central in all that we must discover. Bible prophecy clearly reveals why there are so many denominations. God has particularly revealed the answer to our question about why so many denominations in the book of Revelation. It shares that with us. You see, God has revealed the history of Christianity more clearly than in any other place in Revelation 6. Okay, so notice, no one believes what they do because of Scripture. We don't believe what we do because of Scripture. Only the Adventists. And this sort of thinking permeates the Adventist worldview. Again, they put out this facade that they're completely united they agree on scripture across the board, unlike those confused, unbiblical, tradition-following Protestants who have no basis for their beliefs. <laughs> this sort of thing. That's what's going on here. What, te what Ted really means by this is our... It, it, what he really means by all this is that our interpretation of the Bible is infallible, therefore everything we believe is biblical. Let's use the cursed three angels gospel, for example. You'll ask them to show it to you from the Bible, and they'll literally just read Revelation 14, 6 through 12, thinking that somehow proves anything. Those six verses supposedly tell you the first angel's message had to do with the year 1844 and people listening to William Miller and then the investigative judgment starting, which is a judgment only for professing believers, all the way back to Adam, where the Ten Commandments are the standard by which every person will be judged to see whether or not they've arrived at a state of sinlessness. And if they haven't, they'll be lost, etc. All of that is supposedly present in the phrase, Behold, the hour of his judgment has come. Again, completely ignoring this was written almost 2,000 years ago. It has nothing to do with 1844. Had application to people long before then. The phrase come out of Babylon, it's just obviously talking about Protestants needing to leave their church and come join the remnant because Ellen White claimed Babylon meant what they believe. And she was receiving it from God himself. End of story. That's what Ted actually means by their system is biblical. They can point to little proof texts here and there, insert a bunch of stuff into it, and that makes it biblical. Here's an experiment for you, Christian. <laughs> Try the same thing with them. Tell them that they don't actually believe the Bible. Choose what doctrine you want to highlight. Then simply cite a couple verses and say, see, that's what the Bible says. So if you disagree with me, you're a tool of Satan. You're deceived. And if you reject my interpretation, your fate will be that of Satan's. See how well the Adventists will yield to that practice. I'm guaranteeing you. I guarantee you. They'll argue and say, no, your interpretation's flawed. Here's why. And then they'll seek to expound upon the verse. But now when it comes to their system, nope. You disagree with their interpretation, you're disagreeing with God's messenger, Ellen G. White, and she sheds light onto the greater light, meaning she's the infallible interpreter. What she says goes. She corrects inaccurate interpretations of scripture. That's what their statement of confidence in her writing states. And stick around to the end if you're an Adventist because we're going to show primary source documentation that says this exact same thing beyond just the statement of confidence in her writings. It is the never-ending double standard of Seventh-day Adventism. But understand, 
That is what Ted means by if it's in the Bible, it's for me. And that everything he's going to present will be strictly from the Bible. That's what he means. He'll simply cite proof texts, make assertions, assume his Adventist worldview, and then marvel at how biblical Adventist theology is. And of course, Revelation supposedly tells us why, is there, why there's a variety of denominations. Adventist theology, like every apocalyptic group, is fundamentally built on the apocalyptic books of Scripture. Not the plain, clear, didactic parts, but the symbolic, easy to twist and bend to make fit with your narrative parts. So Revelation supposedly tells us why there are so many denominations. That's what John had in mind, right? Because again, Revelation's focus is post-1844, silly Christian. Didn't you know that? Now let's hear how John the Apostle supposedly was prophesying about different denominations. He's revealed the history of Christianity from the first century in the days of Christ right down to the 21st century in, when, in which we find ourselves right now. And he's revealed how Christianity would begin as one movement, one body, and then would break into varying denominations. He explains why those denominations would emerge. And this is one of the most fascinating, one of the most exciting prophecies in the entire Holy Word. Revelation chapter 6. So here we have Revelation's four horsemen. They represent four successive ages in the history of the church. Now, the author of this prophecy, the one that opens the seals of this prophecy, is Jesus Christ himself. Revelation 6 and verse 1, let's look at it. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Now, who is, who is this? All right. Jesus, the Lamb of Revelation. So Jesus gives us now the history of Christianity. Now, Revelation 6 continues. And it says... And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. Verse 2. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. Now remember, previously, just in the last phrase, it says, this voice was like thunder. Come and see. This is something God wants you to understand today. A white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Pastor Finley mentioned this particular horse and the rider this morning in his presentation. You see, there are four horses that gallop across the sky, one right after the other. When Jesus opens these seals, he shows church history in phases. The first period is represented by a white horse. As Pastor Finley mentioned, white is a symbol of purity. And the one riding that horse, wearing a crown, is Jesus himself. He goes out conquering and to conquer. Now, the first phase of the Christian church is pictured as a rider on a white horse, triumphing and conquering all the forces of evil. And that's what that horse in this beautiful panel represents over to your right side as you look at it. The white horse represents a powerful, pure faith. In the New Testament, God's truth triumphed. From A.D. 31, after the death of Christ, 
to AD 100, the disciples preached the truth of God's word powerfully through the power of the Holy Spirit. One Roman writer wrote the following. It's an amazing statement. You Christians are everywhere. You are in our armies, in our navies, you are in the marketplace and the shops, you are in our senate and universities, you are everywhere. You see, the New Testament church grew very rapidly. Nothing could stop the progress of Christianity in the first century. Like a white horse, victorious, this white horse is conquering and pushing and moving forward, and the Christian church galloped across the sky. The power of the gospel could not be stopped. All right. So one of the most fascinating prophecies in all of Scripture is that there would eventually be denominations in all of Scripture. Because the churches that John was writing to that were under severe persecution totally gave a rip about that, right? That's totally what they needed to hear amidst why John's writing them. That had some sort of pertinent importance to them in their great time of need. How absurd. No, the most fascinating prophecies and scriptures are those that point pointed to Yahweh himself actually coming and dwelling among us. Yes, Adventists, there's prophecy that doesn't just deal with eschatology. The incarnation, the bridging of the gap between God and man forever by way of the suffering servant that then inherits all the earth as a man and takes total dominion over it, just like he said he would hundreds of years before doing so. Or maybe the Psalter that said that the perfect Passover lamb would come and none of his bones would be broken. Which is exactly what happened. But no, no. Denominations. That's far more fascinating. Because then they get to weasel in the SDA church into the narrative. But he said the history of, the, of Christianity is revealed in more depth than any other place in all of Scripture. In the book of Revelation. I, I just have to say that I'm laughing not at them, but because it's just such an Adventist thing to say. <laughs> if you've come from that world, it's like it's just such an Adventist thing to say that because of course Revelation is their answer to the question. If I were a betting man, which I'm not, my money would 10 out of 10 Go on Daniel and Revelation. But hold up, Ted. You guys were saying the same thing in the 19th century. That Revelation 6 lays out history from the 1st century down to the 19th century. But as time goes on, you guys just tack on another century. This is why I always say that the clock is the biggest enemy of the SDA church. And there's literally nothing they can do to beat it. Because God owns the clock. Adventism will literally be one of Christ's easiest enemies to defeat and put under his feet. Because all he has to do is what he's been doing for 2,000 years. But Ted says that they believe the four horsemen in Revelation 6 are four successive ages in the Christian church's history personified. Meaning, the rider on the horse is a personal figure that represents an age of the Christian church. But he assumes here they know with 100% certainty what every sign, symbol, and number means without question. In this case, it's the white horse and all the imagery surrounding it. The bow, the rider, the color white, and so on. He said Revelation 6 lays out the history of the Christian church from the 1st century down to the 21st century. 
Ted is just parroting here Uriah Smith's book, for those that do not know, Daniel and Revelation, which is his commentary on both, which is ultimately informed by Ellen White. And they all parrot this. We're not going to be able to tackle this in tota, or we'd be here for days. So maybe we'll do that at a later point. But that's what Smith said. Anti-Trinitarian alert, folks. Anti-Trinitarian heretic alert. Notice what he says. Quote, the first symbol, a white horse. This is him commenting Revelation 6. And the rider who bears the bow to, and to whom the crown is given and who goes forth conquering and to conquer is a fit emblem of the triumphs of the gospel in the first century of this dispensation. When he says gospel there, folks, that is not to be confused with the quote unquote everlasting gospel. This is what Herbert Douglas calls a limited gospel. The gospel is just a limited gospel. It's not the everlasting gospel. He continues, the whiteness of the horse denotes the purity of faith in that age and the crown which was given to the rider in his going forth conquering and to make still further conquests, the zeal and success, success with which the truth has promulgated by its earliest ministers. To this, it is objected by the ministers of Christ and the progress of the gospel could not be properly represented by such warlike symbols. But we ask... By what symbols could the work of Christianity better be represented when it went forth as an aggressive principle against the huge systems of the error with which it had to first contend? The rider upon this horse went forth where? His commission was unlimited. The gospel, again, the limited gospel, was to all of the world. Close quote. So again, I just want to emphasize this is not to be confused with the SDA church's everlasting gospel. The apostles' gospel was a present truth message for then. That might be the contention with some people that the gospel wouldn't be described using warlike symbols. But that most certainly isn't going to be my contention or the contention of a, a many others. And I'm not unique in my view, which is why I say that. But what I most want to highlight is that they have to have their assertions on this be correct to validate Adventism. I want to emphasize that. Unlike Christians, our entire system and validation is not built on eschatology like theirs is. They are so convinced they have it all figured out. They're masters of Daniel and Revelation. So much so that their entire movement and foundation is staked on every single chain in the link, which is hundreds of links, being correct. If even one breaks, their whole system falls. That is how foundational eschatology is to their system. But that is what Ted is parroting here. This is what they're using in Adventist universities in their religion department. Shoot, they teach an entire Daniel and Revelation class with this. This is the hardware that Ted was equipped with decades ago, I'm sure. So he says, the white horse represents a pure church, and that Revelation 6 shows how Christianity would start as one unified movement and then splinter into various denominations. Totally absurd. Again, with his equivocating the body of Christ with individual denominations. He's using the word church for both, but then not differentiating between the differences. But second off, Ted, Revelation 6 has nothing to do with denominations. This is a horribly anachronistic reading of the text. It's importing things into the text from your current vantage point. Revelation was written to an arguably first, maybe second century audience. Either way, this idea that John was writing to them about denominations that would spring up in the 16th, 17th centuries is just so ridiculous. 
that has nothing to do with what is in focus for the seven churches that this apocalyptic letter was written to. But then again, that's another faulty problem. The Adventist church believes that the seven churches of Revelation are speaking about the history of the church from within, including apostasies that happened and spiritual conflicts with the, ch with the church being a separate time period. For example, William Miller was supposedly the Philadelphia age of brotherly love. And now the SDAs believe they're in the Laodicean age with lukewarmness. So they take these seven literal churches and ascribe long periods of time to them and claim that's what's in view. So they then say that the seven seals, which begin in Revelation 6, cover the history of the church with each one covering a different emphasis. So that assumption is brought to the text. And that also has to be true for their interpretation of the rest of this to be correct. But Ted and other SDA leaders just state this stuff as fact because Ellen White and the SDH pioneers believed it, stated it, so therefore it's fact. When it comes to the white horse in Revelation, many ancient writers, this is to be objective here, many ancient writers and down through the ages, people like Irenaeus, Marius Victorinus, I love both of them, even a, a number of modern scholars, David Chilton, J.E. Leonard. They see Christ as the one riding the horse. Not the idea of it representing ages of the church, but that the horseman represents Christ, like Ted said. And the argument tends to be that the white horse appears again in Revelation 19.11, where we see Christ on a white horse. They then claim that white must symbolize righteousness or purity, which would further underscore this identity. But I would argue, as many others have, that something else is in view, okay? And I'm going to give you my understanding, which is not completely unique to me, by the way. And it's for the purpose not of saying, you have to think like I do, but to show you this assumption that it's the SDA understanding and there's no other biblical way of understanding it is a facade, okay? There are a number of reasons to think biblically that the SDA church's understanding is false. First, the white horse itself is the only similarity with the vision of Christ in Revelation 19. Nothing else. In fact, in Revelation 19, 5 and 21, Christ doesn't possess the bow that's mentioned in Revelation 6, but a sword. And that's often associated with him in the book. Revelation 1, 16. 212, 216, 19, 25, 21. But the bow never is. Now, the Adventist church asserts that the bow represents the word of God, and they cite Habakkuk 3 9, but more on this in a second. Nevertheless, so the horseman's given a wreath, or some translations say a crown. But Christ wears many diadems crowns in Revelation 19.12, right after 19.11. Also, Revelation 9.7, it has the evil figure wearing crowns and conquering. And it often applies to them in other places as well. Revelation 11.7, 13.7. So, all that to say, it doesn't automatically have to be a righteous figure. Second, Christ's appearance here is out of place. It'd be strange for Jesus both to open the scroll and be its content. As Ted read, the lamb is the one who opens the seal. So he opens the seal, but he's the one on the horse that's coming out of that seal being opened. Third, it doesn't seem fitting for an angel, so it says living creature, to command him that's to come, which is... Verse 2, Revelation 6, 2. And yet, the rider on the white horse is in fact commanded by the living creature. 
So Ted read this. He said, I heard one of the living four creatures or, or sorry, one of the four living creatures saying with a voice of thunder, come. Christ isn't ordered around in Revelation at all. He's equal with the Father in authority. Revelation 3, 21, 5, 12, 22, 1, and 3. Because notice, folks, let me bring it up here. Notice. Uh, sorry, this Bible app got a pop up here. Oh, of course. There we go. Oh, sorry. Of course. It would not be a live stream if some sort of technicality didn't pop up. Okay. There we go. Bible Gateway wanted to do the uh, pop-up in the middle of the stream. Notice what it says in, in verse 1 there. Ted said the living creature saying, Come with a thundering voice, which is supposed to be about God wanting to wanting you to know this today. But who is the living creature saying this to? I would argue, and many others would as well, the creature is saying, come to the riders on the horses after the seal is opened by the lamb, which brings forth the riders. It would seem odd that the rider would be the lamb that's opening the seal, then being told to come by a creature. Christ is not the one taking orders. But here, the living creatures are calling forth the writers, not John. Now, I'm not dogmatic on this by any means. But again, it's just another reason. Fourthly, the writer is given a crown. It says, and a crown was given to him, verse 2. Now, I would argue grammatically, this involves a providential giving or granting which John associates with God giving permission to evil powers to do things under his sovereign administration. And again, the reason for this is the grammar that is seen repeatedly throughout Revelation. Revelation 6, 2, 4, 8. Revelation 9, 1, 3, 11, 12. I mean, it's all throughout the book. This is why a large majority of contemporary scholars do not think that the writer of the White Horse is Christ. People like Beale, G.K. Beale, Craig Keener, Ian Boxwell, I.T. Beckwith, I mean, a number of people. And it's not to say that thinking so is heretical. I just think that there's more evidence for something else that better fits into the overall context of why John was writing, who he's originally writing to, etc. And we'll look at some of mo some more of those in a moment. But as for the white horse, the white the white color could could absolutely represent righteousness or purity, as it does in Revelation nineteen eleven. But that doesn't necessitate the figure itself is a righteous figure. Now, what do I mean by that? I would contend, as many others would, that what's in focus in Revelation six is God judging wicked Israel for her rebellion against Him, leading up to the Jewish war with the Romans and the ultimate destruction of the temple. Because it was God doing the judgment using wicked people to accomplish it, Rome's conquest would have been righteous even though it was done by an unrighteous people. It was done with God's sovereign authority. And you think I'm just grasping at straws here? This is a pattern we find in Scripture by examining God's behavior and actions in history. For example, in a parable prophesying this exact thing, Jerusalem's destruction, Jesus calls the Romans his army, Matthew 22, 7. The SDA church twists the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22 into being about the investigative judgment, not even close to what's in view. And I don't have time to address that in detail tonight. Maybe we'll save that for another stream dedicated to what is the kingdom of God. But I think it can be conclusively said that in this parable, it's talking about Jesus being sent by the Father to his people, Israel, who reject him. Open up Matthew 22 right now, folks, and you see if I'm just grasping at straws here. It is a parable talking about Jesus being sent by the Father to his people, Israel, who rejected him. 
And not just that, but they killed the one whom the father sent, who's the king. And then verse 7 gives us the king's response to them doing this. Again, the king being the father who sent his son. And in verse 7 it says, The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. The Jews are the one that killed Jesus, the one that the father sent. God the father used the Roman armies to destroy them, burn their city and destroy their temple in the Jewish Roman wars culminating in AD 70. So in the parable, Rome, an evil, an evil figure, is said to be God's army. That's how the color white could be associated with righteousness, even if the figure isn't, in this case, Rome. God does the same thing in Isaiah 10, 5, Habakkuk 1, 6. He refers to wicked Assyria as the, quote, rod of his anger. But then he punishes Assyria for their arrogance. Or like God called Nebuchadnezzar, his servant, repeatedly, even though he was a wicked figure, not godly. Jeremiah 25, 27, 2 Kings 24, Jeremiah 4. But all of that to say, the same thing is going on here in Revelation 6. The white color, I would argue, as others would, represents victory. And that's for a few reasons. Again, take it or leave it. I basically want people to see that literally everyone is working with the same imagery and the Bible. So it's really a matter of seeing who has the most evidence. This idea that no other possible conclusion can be deduced from scripture other than what the SDA church is claiming is not only absurd, but it's insulting to the world of biblical scholarship and people who are willing to give their life for this word. First, there are a plethora of resources from antiquity that reference white as victory. You've got Seneca, I mean, I mean Herodias, all, just, there's all sorts of works of antiquity that deal with white being a symbol of victory. And these works were written around the same time as the Revelation. Apocalyptic literature had guidelines for properly reading it. It was a very common genre in the first and second centuries. And white was often associated with victory. So that's one. Two, the text states that the writer goes forth to conquer. Revelation 6.2. The Adventist church says this is the apostolic church successfully going forth and advancing, which was completely pure. Now, myself and many others would argue it's talking about a different figure altogether doing a different type of conquest, and I will state why in a moment. But three, there are places in Scripture where a bow is symbol is a symbol of victory. Revelation, or Revelation, sorry. Zechariah 9, 10 through 14. As well as flip side examples that use the picture of breaking bows as a symbol of peace resulting from victory. So you've got the positive and the negative on this. Like in the Psalter, specifically Psalm 46, 46, 9, as well as 1 Samuel 2. Now the SDA church says the bow is the word of God based on Habakkuk 3, 9. I don't think that's what Habakkuk is saying in his prayer to God. But let's concede that it still doesn't automatically necessitate the word of God as what's in view in Revelation 6 too. It could very easily be understood to be victory using the same methodology of interpretation they use, which is to point to the word somewhere else representing something in the Bible and then plugging it in. Well, we can do that exact same thing based both on the context of Zechariah 9, 10 through 14, which is far more fitting, but also the negative affirmation of the breaking of bows in Psalm 46 and 2 Samuel being a symbol of peace resulting from victory being achieved. There's nothing in this text that necessitates their interpretation. Nothing in the text even necessitates the assumption that the writers are different periods of church history personified. But again, this is what the Adventist church means by everything they believe is biblical. Side a verse, Claim you know what it is with absolute certainty because you have the spirit of prophecy to comment on it. Case closed. You disagree, you're going against God, and you just don't believe the Bible. And yes, we will be demonstrating this with primary source material later. 
But do you see how that works? Fourth reason why white being representative of purity doesn't necessarily have to be a righteous figure. And this is a big one. I would argue the white color represents the effects of the writer. Why? This is the case in terms of conquering. So this white horse is, is conquering. That's the effects of the writer. It's because the other horse's colors reflect that. Their results. The red represents bloodshed, Revelation 6-4. Black is starvation by famine. Pale equals death in Revelation 6-8, etc. This was talking about the Roman armies that would prevail, but it will be God's doing in using them as a tool in his hands to chastise his rebellious people. That is what's going on here. And this is not uncommon in scripture. God very regularly uses evil figures to judge men, calling them his own. On top of Matthew 22, 7, like I said, Isaiah 10, you've got Judges 9, 1 Samuel 16, 23, 18, 19, 1 Kings 22. This is a common theme in Scripture. And there are other symbols that Scripture provides that could also be plugged in that might suit the overall context of why the book is being written, when it was written, etc. But they act like the text somehow demands their interpretation, and ultimately, that's what they believe. They think the spirit of prophecy is Jesus speaking, giving the infallible interpretation of Scripture. And like I said, we will look at their own words later showing this. It's not just me saying this. If you're an Adventist, stick around. We're going to get to your own primary sources saying this. Yes, that is what's going on here. It's not just, oh, we just believe the Bible, like Ted said. Primacy of Scripture. No, it's not. What are you talking about, dude? You are huffing your own smoke, and you know it. But completely denuding the book of Revelation from history like the SDA church has done, making all of this have to revolve around writing themselves into the story, is fallacious and faulty. Folks, that is not what's going on here. Josephus wrote about this in his book, Jewish War. Read it. Published in AD 75. He documents down how he warned the Jews that they must know the Roman power was invincible. He told them that the power of the Roman, uh, that Rome is invincible in all parts of the inhabitable earth. John's prophecy is tied to the first or second century. Regardless of when you think, you know, there's the post 70 AD and pre 70 AD camps, regardless, John's prophecy is tied to the, the first or second century. He tells you, I mean, Revelation 1 1, 1 3, 22 6. And Revelation 6 is specifically linked to near term expectations. How do we know this? This is a verse that's often brought up, or a section of verses that's often brought up with the SDA church due to the time period at which this is written, but also due to the fact that it says that there are spirits under the altar, which seems to imply uh, their idea of the state of the dead is, is faulty. But notice what it says. 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. How long, O Lord? A little longer. Until the number of the fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. How long, O Lord? A little while longer. This book surrounds the coming destruction of the temple and the devastation of Jerusalem, prophesied by Jesus exactly when he said it would come upon that generation, Adventist. Matthew 24, 34, caused and brought about by the Jewish war with Rome. At the end of the day, the SDA church is working with the same symbols everyone else is. They've not cracked some code that everyone else is just dazed and confused on. They love to tout at their revelation seminars that they've tapped into an understanding no one else has, like some sort of Gnostic fancy. They'll say revelation was a closed book until they came along. Everyone was confused 
hyped about it because Satan used the Jesuits to tell people that Revelation can't really be understood and other ridiculous conspiracies. No, the reality is everyone else is simply honest enough to admit that this is a tricky area of theology dealing with apocalyptic literature from antiquity, which has a lot of moving parts and factors. The SDA church wants to act like saying such a thing is blasphemy, when no, it's called living in reality. The difference is they emphatically assert with 100% certainty that they know they are correct and they have God's stamp of approval on it. Nope, they don't. Again, they're working with the same information everyone else is, and everyone else's eschatology has problems. Everyone's eschatology has problems. I don't care what the SDA church asserts. I know all the major positions and understand all the problems for all of them. But the SDA church can't have that, or the whole thing collapses which is why they dogmatically assert that they think they've cracked every sign, symbol, number, etc., because they're supposedly masters of Bible prophecy. They know it all. They have it all figured out. Kind of like how Ellen White claimed to be shown the day and hour of Jesus is coming multiple times, that the time of trouble was going to come upon that generation in the 1800s and so on. How she was told that that generation was the, the 144,000 that were given the day and the hour in her very first vision. And then their scholars try and say, Ellen White was never explicit of who the 144,000 were. Baloney. We have the receipts of this on our website. Just type in 144,000 into the search bar, answeringadventism.com. They are full of it. Yes, she was dogmatic and definitive about who the 144,000 were, and she was wrong. Meaning she fails the test of a prophet yet again. But also, you guys aren't as buttoned up on your eschatology as you think. No, no, no. We're supposed to ignore all that. You know, they're reinterpreting and going back to the drawing board. But hey, they're Bible prophecy experts, right? Figures on the Miller chart. Ellen said they were never to change. Oh, they changed three times? No, no, no. God gave new light. Present truth. Present truth had his hand over a mistake and was testing his people. Bible prophecy experts. This is why I don't even like talking about eschatology that much because of, especially with former Adventists, depends who I'm talking with. Because people have eschatological PTSD because of this movement. Now, all of that to say, Ted and the SDA system make a whole lot of assumptions. He cites these things like time periods as de facto statements and then moves along as if it's all without question, which in their minds, it is. Ellen White's commentary says so. That makes it so, period. Revelation 6 is not talking about denominations or the history of the Christian church into the far distant future. That had zero relevance to the people John was writing to. He wasn't writing them to let them know there's going to be denominations that will come about in 1,500 years or so. It's just silly. But the, but the SDA church is able to glean all this from literally two passages because they supposedly, with 100% certainty, know what every symbol in Revelation is because they have the infallible interpreter. It is talking primarily about events that were soon to take place. God through John went to great lengths to tell us. I mean, Revelation 1.1. It's, it's basically the first thing he tells us. But the SDA church avoids anything that has to do with imminency unless it has to do with the return of Christ. Otherwise, they have to postpone it until at minimum the 19th century. They have to find a way to drag stuff all the way out to write themselves into the narrative. They have to find, always have to find a way to work themselves into the story because that's precisely what the SDA pioneers, including Mrs. White, did. Now, this does not mean, just as a disclaimer before we get back to his video, this does not mean that Revelation doesn't have application to any other generation, nor does it mean the entire book of Revelation has come to pass yet. But the Adventist church is reading is, in, is completely anachronistic. 
is reading in such a way that they can write themselves into the narrative, as we're going to see later. When men and women do not compromise truth in their own life, the, the power of the church is very real. God cannot sanctify error. The powerful New Testament church, armed with the truth of God and filled with the Holy Spirit, made an impact on the Roman world. But now the scene changes. The second seal is open. A red horse gallops across the sky. The fourth verse in Revelation 6 says, Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Let's get the picture now. Satan saw that he could not stop this triumphal church represented by that galloping white horse. It was triumphing everywhere. He had to do something. So he began a fierce era of bloody persecution. He influenced political leaders to viciously persecute the Christians. So the red horse represents a bloody faith. We showed this picture previously, the Colosseum in Rome. Christians were thrown to the lions. Christians were persecuted. You see, a white horse represents a powerful, pure truth. The red horse in the second seal represents a blood-stained faith. So from the year A.D. 100 to the year A.D. 313, the Christians were persecuted terribly in the blood-stained faith period. So the white horse, apostolic power and purity. The red horse, a blood-stained faith. Now, where the white horse represents a church triumphant, the red horse represents a church persecuted. But the church continues to grow. Satan persecuted it, but he couldn't stop it. One early Christian writer wrote the following, which is an amazing admission of the power of God in the church. He said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. All right. So the red horse is a bloody faith during time of persecution. So says Mr. Wilson in the SDA Church. Notice, folks, for those who have been on this channel, who know anything about what's going on here, notice the great controversy worldview filling in the gaps. He said, quote, Satan saw that he could not stop the triumphal church by the white horse, so he had to do something and begin a fierce era of persecution by influencing political leaders to viciously persecute Christians, and it pertains to the years A.D. 100 to A.D. 313 when the Christians were per persecuted. All of that is supposedly laid out in those two verses. And if you disagree with it, remember, you disagree with the Bible. All of that is supposedly just there, right there in the text, right? It talks about satan and how the white all this stuff none of that is what's in view in this chapter folks that would have meant nothing to the people john was originally writing to yes you have to take that into consideration mr adventist 
You can't come along in the 19th century and just read yourself into the narrative like they have. Then he had the audacity to quote Tertullian. He actually misquoted him, by the way. Tertullian said the blood of the martyrs is the seat of the church, not the seat of the gospel. But nevertheless, I love this quote. So much so that I have it depicted in imagery tattooed on the back of my arm. But nevertheless, Ted, why are you citing the same Tertullian that in response to the Jews of his day wrote this? Oh. Quote, Let him who contends that the, talking about the seventh day Sabbath here, is still observe, uh, let him who contends that the Sabbath is still to be observed as a balm of salvation and circumcision on the eighth day teach us that for the time past, righteous men kept the Sabbath or practiced circumcision and were thus rendered friends of God. For if circumcision purges a man, since God made Adam uncircumcised, why did he not circumcise him, even after his sinning, if circumcision purges? Therefore, since God originated Adam, un, if God unoriginated Adam uncircumcised and unobservant of the Sabbath, consequently his offspring also Abel, offering his sacrifices uncircumcised and unobservant of the Sabbath was by him, talking about God, commended. And he quotes from Genesis 4, 1 through 7, Hebrews 11, 4. Noah also uncircumcised, yes, and unobservant of the Sabbath. God freed from the deluge. For Enoch too, most righteous man, uncircumcised and unobservant of the Sabbath, he translated him from this world who did not first taste death in order that being a candidate for eternal life, he might show us that he may, or he also may without the burden of the law of Moses, please God. So hold on now. Why are you citing from one of the patristics that your guys' fundamental belief that we looked at earlier says wasn't one of the faithful through all the ages. He didn't view the law of God the way that you guys do, nor the view of the fourth commandment you guys do. So according to you guys and your fundamental belief, Tertullian wasn't one of the faithful through all the ages, like I mentioned earlier and said to remember. He was an ardent defender of the Lord's Day being Sunday, not the Judaizing Day. Also, this is over a hundred years before your guys' historical revisionism claiming the Sabbath was changed in the 4th century by Constantine and Pope Sylvester. Whether you agree with every point that Tertullian presents or not, that doesn't change history. The same Tertullian that countless SDAs have told me was a pagan, a heretic, etc., but like I've said before, when they need an escape hatch, they're willing to appeal to people that they'll call heretics when it fancies the narrative. Ted, you mentioned this in light of the martyrs fed to lions. You mean like Ignatius, who on his way to be fed to the lions, wrote this? Buckle up, folks. Those who were brought up in the ancient order of things, meaning the Jews, have come to the possession of a new hope. No longer observing the Sabbath, but living in the observance of the Lord's day. On which also our life has sprang up again by him and by his death. Close quote. Letter to the Magnesians, number nine. Second century, turn of the first century. The same Ignatius that Adventists have to label a heretic, a pagan. Say this epistle's a forgery, yada yada. Like this site that parents this that uh, parrots this the same sort of historical revisionism that SDAs do. This is Steve Rudd. He's a, res a restorationist, Church of Christ guy. But we're bringing him up just because he's making the same arguments that literally the SDA church does. The SDA church does. But look what he claims. This is the identical claim that the SDA church makes. 
quote, all scholars, notice what it says at the top, the 15 forgery forged letters of Ignatius. He says, all scholars reject eight of Ignatius's alleged writings as forgeries and say the seven remaining letters are genuine and were written in AD 110. Some scholars reject them as them all as forgeries that were written about 250 AD. The third point, notice what he says. This is the same thing SDAs will say. We take the firm view that all 15 Ignatian letters are forgeries. All of the letters that claim to be written by Ignatius are fakes. Almost nothing is known about the real Ignatius. See Philip Schaff's comments below. Ah, everyone wanting to appeal to Philip Schaff to try and support their crazy views. But then notice what it says here down in point D. Philip Schaff rejects all of Ignatius' letters as spurious. Philip Schaff acknowledges that there has been a broad and long-standing view that all the Ignatian letters are forgeries and leaves the matter to the reader for, to decide for himself. Schaff does clearly, re does clearly reject all the letters as forgeries, as can be seen in his comments. Yeah, we're going to look at his comments. Just like we did a few weeks ago. And I know that that was a Church of Christ guy, but the SDAs claim the same things. They just do so for a different reason. Steve is, is doing that because of their uh, of because of ecclesiological reasons. Because things that Ignatius and, and what he says regarding the church doesn't align with how the Church of Christ looks. In terms of the Adventists, it's that epistle to the Magnesians. We have to dismiss that because clearly it shows the Lord's Day being used by the apostle, his own disciple, Ignatius, his own disciple, using the term Lord's Day to refer to something in contrast to the Jewish Sabbath. So it has to be a forgery. So it's for Sabbatarian reasons. But we're going to look at Schaff's comments, the ones that this site omitted. And we're going to ask ourselves, is this true? Schaff rejected all of the epistle, the, the Ignatian epistles. So let's look at Schaff's comments on the Ignatian epistles. This is Dr. Schaff's History of the Christian Church. The chapter is titled The Ignatian Controversy. We looked at this chapter, uh, or, or rather we looked at this book, um, the chapter on Constantine a few weeks back regarding SDA pioneer Jay and Andrews completely butchering what, Cha what Schaff said. The same Jay and Andrews that said no one could question Schaff's reliability regarding church history. So let's do the same with these claims. After all Dr. Schaff has to say about the, Igna the Ignatian epistles, look what he ends it with, okay? You can look this up yourself, folks. You can look it up online. What does he end it by saying? Again, this chapter is the Ignatian controversy regarding Ignatius's epistles that that site was quoting from that SDAs will often quote from as well. What does he end it with? The only genuine Ignatius, as the question now stands, is the Ignatius of the shorter seven Greek epistles. No, Schaff does not agree that all 15 of the Ignatian epistles were forgeries, like Adventists try to claim, thinking it helps their case. He agrees that the seven Greek ones are legitimate, which is what the letter to the Magnesians is a part of. I really wish Adventists would stop trying to appeal to the likes of Schaff to try and bolster support for their Judaizing. Schaff is not a friend of SDA theology, folks. They love quoting Philip Schaff because they know how rep and renowned Schaff is as a Protestant Christian church historian. But he was a tried and true Reformed theologian, a Calvinist, which the SDA church despises with a passion. Yet, they're forever trying to ride the coattails of my spiritual ancestors to bolster their Judaizing. 
whether it's Schaff, the Waldensians, and so on. These people were honest, folks, not friendly to SDA theology. Do not let them. But ironically, in light of that, here's Dr. Schaff's translation of Ignatius's epistle to the Philadelphians, which is a very fitting response to all of this. Quote, if anyone preach the Jewish law unto you, listen not to him. For it's better to hearken to Christian doctrine from a man who's been uncircumcised than to Judaism from one uncircumcised. It is better to hearken to Christian doctrine from a man who has been circumcised than to Judaism from one uncircumcised. What a quote. The SDA church fits the bill of that last line perfectly. The uncircumcision party trying to preach Judaizing to us. And no, that also isn't from one of the eight alleged forgeries. But all that to say, these folks were not a part of the lineage of the faithful, Ted, that you guys claim is the lineage of the faithful. So why are you citing someone like Tertullian when he wasn't even referring to what you call the church. The blood of those martyrs was not the seed of what you guys think the church is. Ignatius was not one of these sacred defenders of the, the Seventh-day Sabbath that you guys like to try and claim made up the real church in the first and second century. Neither was Tertullian. This was 200 years before you guys claimed the Sabbath was changed and he uses the term Lord's Day in contrast to the Jewish Sabbath, showing that he didn't understand that phrase the way you guys do. It's funny. You'll hear SDA say these things about people like Ignatius. Those are all forgeries. We know virtually nothing about him. But then these same people will say that Ignatius was actually a Seventh-day Sabbatarian. We know nothing about him. You can't say that, but he was a Seventh-day Sabbatarian. And just so we're clear, for the Adventists, how do I know Tertullian and Ignatius are dismissed as being Christians by the SDA church? Ellen White, great controversy. Yes, great controversy. Page 52. In the first centuries, of the, in the, first centuries the true Sabbath had been kept by all Christians. They were jealous for the honor of God and believing that his law is immutable, they zealously guarded the sacredness of its precepts. But with great subtlety, Satan worked through his agents to bring about his object. That the attention of the people might be called to the Sunday, it was made a festival in honor of the resurrection of Christ. Religious services were held upon it, yet it was regarded as a day of recreation the Sabbath, referring to the Seventh-day Sabbath, being still sacredly observed. No, it wasn't. It wasn't made a festival in honor of the resurrection. As Ignatius rightly pointed out, it's rooted in the new creation. That's what he means by our life sprang up on that day. The new creation of which the resurrection was the inauguration point. It has nothing to do with Constantine making it a festival. This is hundreds of years before Constantine even was born. So Ted quotes Tertullian, saying the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, but his prophetess says all true Christians in the first couple centuries all kept the Seventh-day Sabbath, which eliminates both Tertullian and Ignatius from being true Christians, according to her. And that's a thus saith the Lord statement, by the way, folks. How do we know that? Selected Messages, Book 3, page 122. Quote, we've looked at this before. How many have read carefully Patriarchs and Prophets? Great controversy, Adventists. There it is. What we just quoted from. And Desire of Ages. I wish all to understand that my confidence in the light that God has given stands firm because I know that the Holy Spirit's power magnified the truth and made it honorable, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. In my books, the truth is stated, barricaded by a thus saith the Lord. 
the Holy Spirit traced these truths upon my heart and mind as indelibly as the law was traced by the finger of God upon the tables of stone, which are now in the ark to be brought forth in that great day when sentence will be pronounced against every evil, seducing science produced by the father of lies. Quote, close quote. So according to the Adventist God, Tertullian and Ignatius weren't even Christians. The real church was this small, hardly known, virtually no record of pocket of people all the way down through history. Everyone they try and appeal to to say these were Seventh-day Sabbatarian torchbearers were not. The same Ignatius, alongside Polycarp, were disciples of John the Apostle who penned the book of Revelation. Nope, they weren't Christians, says the, the God of Adventism through Ellen White a disciple of one of the apostles. But we're supposed to sacrifice him, a man fed to pagans, essentially, at the behest of lions for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're supposed to sacrifice him to a fanatic in the 19th century who claimed God was speaking through her, that they were restoring the true church and falsely, and she falsely asserted to be shown by God amongst a number of things over seven times the day and the hour of Christ's return? Yeah, not going to happen. You are out of your mind. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. The same Ignatius, writing 200 years before Pope Sylvester supposedly coined the term Lord's Day for Sunday, like SDA pioneer J. N. Andrews erroneously claimed in his book History of the Sabbath, which again we looked at a few weeks ago when he when we responded to Ted's assistant Mark Finley. Remember this, folks. Remember this quote. Quote: We have proved that the Sunday festival in the Christian Church had no sabbatical character before the time of Constantine, meaning it wasn't seen as a rest day. We've also shown that heathenism in the person of Constantine first gave to Sunday its sabbatical character, and in the very act of doing it, designated it as a heathen, and not as a Christian festival, this establishing a heathen Sabbath. It was now the part of popery, author uh, popery authoritatively to effect its transformation into a Christian institution, a work which was not slow to perform. Sylvester was the bishop of Rome while Constantine was the emperor. How faithfully he acted in his part in transforming the festival of the sun into a Christian institution is seen in that by his specific or by his apostolic authority, he changed the name of the day, giving it the imposing title of Lord's Day. To Constantine and Sylvester, therefore, the advocates of first day observance are greatly indebted so many errors so little time we're already at almost three hours wow he says constantine established sunday as a heathen sabbath yet his prophetess explicitly states over and over sorry about that it was his prophetess that states over and over and over again it was the pope that changed it early writings page 32 quote I saw from vision from God that God had not changed the Sabbath for he never changes, but the Pope had changed it from the seventh to the first day of the week for he was to change times and laws. Close quote. So she saw, meaning by God, that the Pope changed the Sabbath. So which one was it, Adventist? The Pope or Constantine? Constantine was never a Pope. Jan Andrews said he didn't change, the, Pope Sylvester I didn't change the Sabbath. He just gave it an imposing title of the Lord's Day. No, he didn't. Lord's Day is coming from Re Revelation 1.10, goofball. But back to Ignatius' statement. Of course they have to claim that this letter you know, is, is dated to the later 3rd century, that it was a forgery, that he was a heretic. Because on historical grounds alone, this refutes the entire schema. They can't have something like this being authentic or their whole pipe dream of history dissipates. It throws off literally Ted's entire presentation that he's giving. That's This is why they're picking dates that they are like 313 AD. But you mean those martyrs that were fed to Ted or fed to lions, Ted? 
Those giants of the Christian faith that despite the cost were willing to follow Jesus Christ wherever he led, even if it meant to the gallows to be lion food. Those Christians that weren't persecuted for being Judaizers, but were actually persecuted for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, real persecution, not simply having your theology critiqued. It just never ends, folks. All of SDA is telling me constantly that Tertullian was a heretic. Ignatius, Ignatius was a heretic. And here we have the president of their church, the highest office in the organization, quoting him at one of the breakout sessions of the general conference to try and bolster their interpretation of Revelation 6. Okay. The more you persecute us, the more we grow. You see, people standing for their faith, people who were martyred in the name of Jesus were a witness and a testimony to so many others, the church grew. They, they said, those people must have something. I need to know it. It must be the truth. So Satan changed the strategy from persecution to something else. And let me tell you, the devil is like a roaring lion, the Bible says, going around who he will devour. Beware. Stand on the Lord's side and let the Lord defend you when the devil shows up at your door. Well, so Satan changed the strategy from persecution to something else. And what was that? A third horse gallops across the sky. This black horse, it represented the period of A.D. 313 to A.D. 538. Let's read in verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it, had a pair of scales in his hand. After 200 years of persecution, Satan used a different model because what he was using was not working. The Christian church kept growing. The blood of Christians is seed. So his new strategy, and let me tell you, he's using that today. In the church, outside of the church, in your life, in my life, trying to bring about compromise. Okay, you give a little, I'll give a little. Let's not worry exactly about all the fine things about truth. Let's just make it a bit fuzzy. Don't worry, let's all get together. Beware, my friends, here in Indianapolis and around the world, beware of compromise. So his master strategy was, and this was an amazing way in which he went about it, was to bring pagan practices into the church. So as the white horse, depicted in this beautiful panel over on your right side, represents purity, the black horse in Revelation represents compromise and error coming into the church. So this black horse represents the period in church history from 313 to 538 A.D. All right. So again, notice how Ted refers to the church that was persecuted early in this universal sense, trying to bolster the idea that they are somehow inheritors of those individuals. Because that's what all this is leading to, to writing the SDA church into the narrative as the end times remnant at the end of this chain from the apostles. Yet those individuals were not Judaizers. They aren't a part of the faithful in all the ages that their fundamental belief claims makes up the church. Furthermore, notice how Ted's reading is entirely through the lens of the great controversy. It is all about what Satan's doing. They claim to have all this extra insight into Satan. 
So the original audience that read what we call Revelation 6, chapter and verse divisions, are a 15th century or 1500s rather addition to the text. That original audience was supposed to understand that these horsemen are different ages of time and represent Satan using different strategies to try and attack the church. All of that supposedly laid out in these verses. Of course not. Again, this is at, this is Ted's Adventist lens doing the interpretation. Nothing in these verses is about Satan trying new strategies and long periods of time. John is writing the revelation to a people in his day. Completely ignoring that to then read back into the text 2,000 years later. And what you want to be there is not sound hermeneutics. But notice again. This is all supposedly crystal clear just from the Bible. It's just obvious. All these arbitrary dates, what the symbols represent. Nothing in the text tells you with absolute certainty that these are long periods of time. This is their interpretation. Yes, Adventists, your interpretation. They simply think that they have an inspired one, which makes them correct. Which is why, like Ted, they just state these things as de facto, no questions asked. He claims this black horseman represents the period of 8313 to 8538. Again, just regurgitating, obviously, Uriah Smith's commentary. Where's this stated in the text, Ted? This is one of my issues with historicism, personally. It's an arbitrary plugging in of dates and events to fit a chronology or timeline one wants to make happen. Where in the text is this stated, Ted, that after years of persecution, Satan introduced compromise and influenced the adoption of pagan practices by the church? Where is that stated in the two verses that you read? It doesn't. And I'm not saying whether or not that did or didn't happen. My point is, the text in reference doesn't say this. That is your interpretation. Yet they want to act like when you engage with them, this is just what's plainly found in the Bible. And if you disagree, you don't believe the Bible. When in reality, they're in the same boat everyone else is. There are plenty of reasons to disagree with the SDA Church's bad hermeneutics and interpretation. And it's not because you hate the Bible or don't believe the Bible because of it. But they have to have it this way to write themselves into the narrative. And that's the key. That's what he's leading everyone toward. We're not even going to get through like half of this presentation. He, he does a bunch of this. He'll cite verses and then he just monologues the script. Cites a couple of verses, monologues the script. And it's just asserted that this is what it is. And if you disagree, you don't believe the Bible. There's no other possible interpretation because they've mastered eschatology. They're eschatology masters. They're the guardians of eschatology. So the Black Horseman is a period of time personified. And it represents Satan using strategies of paganism and compromise. But he's still using that strategy today. In that time period. That's what John was seeking to communicate to his first century audience. Hey, I know I told you at the beginning of the letter that we're about to go through tribulation together and that I'm a co-laborer with you in that. So stand strong against what, what we're about to experience. In this, I want you to know that many denominations are going to spring up in the future after Satan uses paganism and compromise to try and divide the church. As the Roman centurions are about to lop your head off and tie you to a spike, crucify you, and light you on fire. Remember that. In the future, there's going to be many denominations, which are a result in a tool of Satan. Yeah, that, that's totally what the first century audience wanted to hear, right, folks? Because that totally had meaning to them. This is a common tactic with SDA leadership. They will state general truths, in this case, that Satan is seeking for Christians to compromise, which people hear and think, yep, that's true. But then they'll ramble on and on and on, causing people to forget what was even said. 
and what it was said in reference to. To get you to feel like, oh, like he cited scripture here and then he went on this long monologue and through there, he either bookended it or started it with something that is generally true. Satan wants Christians to compromise. And because he said that and then all this other stuff that sounded like, wow, that means that's what the Bible said. No, none of that is explicitly stated in where he is citing from in Revelation 6. He cites a couple verses, states that it's talking about the years 313 to 538, and then inserts all sorts of extra details from the spirit of prophecy in a long rambling of assertions that the SDA church has made for decades. Notice what he equated compromise to. He said it's the work of Satan that people give a little here and give a little there, speaking about doctrinally. Don't worry, let's all get together. Ted, this is literally what hordes of modern SDAs have done. Adventism's a big tent. The Justin Coos, like, give me a break. You were on the Seeking What They Saw podcast right before I was, when they were filming all those. You were guest one, I was guest two. The entire thesis those guys are putting forth is that Adventism is a wide, diverse, big tent operation with a variety of viewpoints. Thus, their question was, what actually is an Adventist? Beware of compromise. You have heavenly trio compromisers in your midst, full-blown Aryans. You guys have people who completely compromise the long list of Ellen White's extra-biblical additions to the Sabbath. You have people who have compromised the investigative judgment in your ranks. Pastors. The guys on the Seeking What You Saw pod or Seeking What They Saw podcast that you were on. They don't, a number of them don't even believe the investigative judgment. Compromisers. Despite Ellen White claiming these things are the old landmarks of truth that should never be compromised. You guys compromised on Ellen White's holy kiss vision, where she claimed to be shown in vision. I'll, I'll scoot back from my mic. In vision. She claimed to be shown that the holy kiss that Paul signs off with in like the Thessalonians, for example, was supposed to be an ordinance normatively for the church. And that it was to be practiced by the Christian church as an act, as a, as a sacrament and an ordinance. The July 4th, 1871 issue of the Advent Review, because of that vision, states that it was the work of Antichrist as to why the holy kiss wasn't being practiced as an ordinance, but needed to be restored. Yet then, in the July 6th, 1957 issue of your guys' official publication, The Youth's Instructor, you guys claim that despite the holy kiss being, uh, being found throughout Paul's epistles, there's no evidence these injunctions are to be universal in practice by the church until the return of Christ. Folks, if you don't believe me, uh, because I know be people that 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 don't that say you're just you're just saying that you don't know what you're talking about. You're just okay. Answering Adventism.com, folks. Again, you can type in any part of what you see here, and it will pop up in the search bar, folks. Type in "holy kiss." You, this will pop up. Read it for yourself. Everything that's in red is hyperlinked. It's all right here. The papers of the day that aren't even SDA were documenting down at the time of them practicing this that it was turning into frisky behavior. Their own Valentine's Day issue, Advent Review, addressed it. And then it was the word of the little flock vision in 1847 that was regarding the holy kiss where she claimed that the synagogue of Satan knew that God had loved the little flock, which was the early SDAs, because they were the ones practicing foot washing in the holy kiss. Yet fast forward all the way to here, this issue of the youth instructor, July 16, 1957. They're claiming that despite the holy kiss being found throughout Paul's epistles, there's no evidence these injunctions are to be universal and practiced by the church until the return of Christ. So 
So you guys compromised on Allied's vision and admit she was a fraud. I, I could go on and on and on. If compromise is the hallmark work of Satan, Ted, you guys are steeped in it. In your small little bubble, you have factions and splintering off the rails, yet it's Protestants that are confused. This sort of division is supposed to be a hallmark of Babylon, doctrinal confusion, yet that describes you guys perfectly. So Paul was concerned about the compromises in his own day. In Acts 20, 29 and 30, we read what Paul said. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. So wolves who attack a beautiful pasture full of a flock or a group of sheep, these wolves would come into the church and they would destroy. You see, the teachings of men would be substituted for the teachings of God himself. My friends, in Indianapolis, right here in this Performing Arts Center. Do not be deceived by someone who tells you something which is not in accordance with the Word of God. My goodness. Acts 20, 29 through 30. The irony, Ted. Ted, Paul is describing you guys. You guys are a professional steep or sheep stealing organization. Your movement's identity is rooted in this. You're the wolves that Paul warned the church about who have crept in secretly to spy out our freedom and begin proselytizing your novel doctrine onto the body of Christ. Trying to lead people after a false Christ and a false gospel away from the true shepherd. My goodness, man. John 10, those of us who have entered the true door and sheepfold, which Jesus says is himself, enjoying the beautiful field of salvation as we graze, our souls at rest in Christ, enjoying the work of the shepherd for us, and you guys are trying to climb over the fence in your sheep suits to begin trying to lead us out the door into a fake door that's propped up at the edge of a cliff. Your guy's entire mission is to Christians. The sheep. It's hard-coded into your theology that Christians are an abomination to God because we reject your guys' false doctrine. Remember the quotes from the beginning, folks. If you missed the beginning, you missed the foundation we laid for all this. Remember to be listening with that background information in mind. This organization is a wolf. An attacker and accuser and that's crept in to spy out our freedom in Christ. Every time I hear an Adventist talking about false prophets and wolves, I'm just dumbfounded at the like, hello. Are you serious? This is the last movement that should be warning on such a thing. He said the teachings of men suited for the teaching of God. Again, I'm not I'm not arguing whether or not that has happened at all in history. But oh, you mean like the health message and the investigative judgment and all the other novel doctrines that on the one hand you claim are apostolic, but on the other hand you claim are present truth messages that no one prior to you guys preached? Like those teachings of men, Ted? Give me a break. That's why we totally reject your false doctrine. It isn't in accordance with the word of God. You guys claim it is by anachronistically reading the Bible and trying to, to back read all of your 19th century novelties into scripture. 
But again, you guys claim the three angels messages are a present truth message that none of the apostles, we just looked at this last week. I can show you source after source after source, your own, your own official source documents where you have people saying none of the apostles, the church fathers, the medieval fathers, or the reformers preached your message. But it's biblical, right? The men that penned the scriptures didn't preach it, but it's biblical. Yeah, okay. In this period, religious leaders arose teaching perverse, crooked, deviating things. By compromise, the church became large and had political power, but it was weak spiritually. Human tradition would take the place of the primacy of the Holy Word of God, the Bible. Now, that's a very important point for you to remember. The primacy of Scripture. But he told us that Revelation 6, 4 through 5, is supposedly talking about religious leaders rising up between the years 313 and 538, but it's actually the strategy Satan is still using, so it isn't unique to that time period. That's what John's trying to tell you in Revelation 6. Ted, you guys are the religious leaders that Satan has used to teach perverse, crooked, deviating things. You guys love pointing the finger at Rome. And don't get me wrong, I have my theological disagreements with Rome. But you guys are the last ones that should be critiquing anyone regarding crooked, perverse theology. I guess Revelation 6, 4 through 5 is actually about the entire length of human history because none of what Ted is describing is unique to 313 to 538. That's going on long before then. This same stuff was happening with national Israel thousands of years before. Ted is doing the SDA shuffle here. He reads the text makes a bunch of assertions, reads a couple verses from Acts 20, which have nothing to do with Revelation 6, followed making a bunch of assertions. Ta-da! It's like a magic trick. That now proves that Revelation 6 is talking about all of these assertions and it leading us to understanding that denominations are a product of Satan to confuse and deceive people. Even though the SDA church wants to be considered a denomination amongst the body of Christ, we responded to Doug Bass or Fables talk that was like a 45 minute talk. It took us five hours to go through it. And in that talk, he balks and scoffs at the idea, or sorry, sorry, folks, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is a different video. I've responded to Doug a, a couple of times. It's in the ones where I where he he claimed that Ellen White isn't viewed as a prophet in the Adventist church, and she's not an elbow interpreter, and it's Bible only, etc. In that same video, he balks and scoffs at people who say the Adventist church is not to be considered a valid denomination. He says, of course it is. Denomination just means we have a name on the building. So in those instances where Christians are critiquing Adventists, we're just a denomination like you. But then in an internal talk like this, denominations are a tool of Satan. They want to be considered a denomination amongst the body of Christ, even though the SDA church has a long history of years and years and years of twisting and compromise. He said human tradition took the primacy of the word of God. You mean like how that's functionally what you have done with the writings of Ellen White, who you guys claim is an infallible interpreter because it's supposedly Jesus interpreting the text for us? Here you go, folks. Here you go. Like I said earlier, I said, I'm going to bring this up so people can see. I'm not just saying this. I'm not just talking out the side of my neck. Yes, they teach Ellen White, infallible interpreter. Okay? Review and Herald, June 3, 1971. It's on page 5. 
This is the section of that paper uh, of that Review and Herald article, the f- the source of final appeal, where they're talking about how all Protestants claim the Bible as their only infallible guide, yet they're all divided into what Ellen White said, innumerable sects, just like Ted's trying to position. They're really just recycling a lot of Roman Catholic talking points on this, by the way. But nevertheless, look at what they say. Okay? Quote, In the religious world, there are many voices, but many of them give forth uncertain sounds. Where shall men find an infallible interpretation of truth? Christians answer, notice there, they're saying this in contrast to themselves. Christians answer, in God, in him only can truth be found. For he alone sees all things in their true light. He alone knows the end from the beginning. But how are men to know God's mind? How are they to communicate with him and receive the information desired? Again, Christians answer. And I'm telling you folks, notice, Christians answer, not Adventists. It's subtly differentiating between them and Christians. Again, Christians answer, in the Bible is revealed his word and will. This men must study and they shall know. But when the inquirer turns hopefully to this source for a solution of his problems, he is confronted with a discouraging fact. He finds himself surrounded with several hundred sects of Christians, each claiming to be following the Bible as its infallible guide and counselor. These sects differ from one another so markedly that each surrounds itself with a wall of separation designed to assist in maintaining its peculiar characteristics. Close quote. Now see, that that's not true. <laughs> These sects differ from one another so markedly that each surrounds itself with a wall of separation and that wall is designed to assist in maintaining its peculiar characteristics? That's not what's going on. Not at all. It's not designed that way. There's the assumption here that having any theological differences whatsoever is unacceptable. The Bible makes no provision for such. Every single doctrine is foundational. It's all a dividing line issue. Because that's the Adventist mentality. But that's not what's going on in Protestantism. So again, standard common claim from Rome in the East since the Reformation. The SDA church is just regurgitating that. There's a number of problematic assumptions here. But then notice what they say is a solution to alleviating this. The next section, under a section with the heading, How New Sects Are Formed. Quote, one of, his own, one of his own number in studying the Bible arrives at conclusions differing from his body of believers, still talking about this hypothetical person who hears the Bible is, is the infallible authority. Investigation and discussion follow. Strife and division ensue, and a council is called in the the enclosure. The, The two factions are arrayed against each other. Each maintains his position, at least to his own satisfaction from the Bible. A vote is taken on the question, and a majority settle it for the for the enclosure. The minority settle it for themselves. A new sect is then formed. The wall of prejudice is broken down as far as inquiry is is concerned. And once each or and once more he is turned loose upon the uncertain sea of investigation. This illustrates the fact that most denominations, there's the word denominations, at least have no satisfactory court of appeal, that which the Bible is infallible and is the basis of all Christian faith, it needs to be infallibly interpreted to avoid confusion and division. Paging Rome. Buzz, buzz, paging the Roman Sea, the magisterial authority. This is the identical claim that Rome has made since the Reformation. The magisterium is necessary to understand the infallible book because without having the infallible interpreter, you end up with a bunch of confusion and division. But how does the SDA church propose that this is alleviated? This is the key. It's obviously not the magisterium and the papal, the, the, the papal authority and papacy, right? No, no, of course not. They have no popes and cardinals, they tell us, like William Johnson in the, in the Walter Martin discussion. What do they say? Quote, to be reliable, interpretation must come to us through the same channel 
through which came the scripture in the first place. But what is the channel through which scripture came to us? The testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19.10. It was the spirit of Jesus that spoke through the prophets, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 11. Thus, if we go up here, sorry, they continue. Thus, the prophets have always been the living, active voice of God to his people. And the products of the prophets have always been the guide that alone the people could follow to sure success. This voice has always been its own interpreter. Thus, when we can find in the writings of Isaiah or Jeremiah something that explains some statements in the writings of Moses, when a writer of the New Testament explains a passage in the Old Testament, this is accepted not as a private interpretation, but as settling all dispute because the interpretation came through the same source or channel as the words for which the meaning is sought. Thus, here it is, folks. Protestants have always claimed that the Bible is its own interpreter. Perhaps it's better to say the spirit of prophecy. We use the term here as synonymous with the gift of prophecy or testimony of Jesus is its own interpreter. Ah, so no. It isn't the papacy. That's not who gives the infallible interpretation of the magisterium, but Jesus supposedly speaking through the writings of Ellen White. So that's what we're to trust to lead us into all truth. This is the exact same argument that Rome has made. That you can't have a reliable interpretation of the infallible scriptures because you aren't infallible. And look at all the different groups that all claim to believe the Bible yet disagree. They essentially argue that because there's disagreements amongst people, you obviously can't know the, the proper understanding. Which is the same erroneous reason, re, reasoning that atheists will use to say Christianity can't be true. Because look at all the competing religions of the world. Since there's disagreements, that therefore proves you can't know which one's correct. It's just not sound reasoning. Different discussion for a different day. The point being, this is why Ted is presenting Revelation 6 the way that he is. He thinks they have an infallible interpretation of Jesus speaking through Ellen White's writings, giving the proper understanding of the biblical text. They have simply replaced the papacy and the magisterial see with the writings of a woman from the 19th century that they, that, that they slap with the label of Jesus is speaking here. Spirit of prophecy is found here. No, no, it's not like the Pope or the Magisterium because that's men claiming to be infallible. We're saying Jesus is speaking through Ellen White's writings. It's God speaking, not man. But she isn't a prophet, remember folks? <laughs> All the SDAs that love to distance themselves from Ellen White. We just believe the Bible. Okay, well your church openly states that you can't just believe the Bible without having an infallible interpreter to give you the correct interpretation. Gee, it's kind of like I've been saying on this platform from day one, and SDAs will claim, I'm lying. I'm confused. I don't know what I'm talking about. At the beginning of this talk, remember that Ted said, if it's in the Bible, it's for me. If it isn't, it, then it's not. And he had the audience say it along with him. Ted, what you mean is, if Ellen White's writings tell me this is what the Bible is saying, it's for me. If it disagrees with Ellen's interpretation, it's not for me. Because at the end of the day, denominations being a product of Satan is not coming from the Bible. It's coming from Ellen White, like we read at the beginning. And you believe that that's shedding infallible interpretive light onto the Bible, therefore it must be biblical. No, that isn't in the text. It's coming from your infallible interpreter. It is your interpretation. It's not in the text. It is your interpretation. You simply think that you have an infallible one. So don't tell us you guys only believe the Bible and balk and scoff at tradition. When you literally have a tradition, you call the spirit of prophecy and the great controversy theme to then interpret the Bible for you. I mean, you, you guys fault Rome for the exact same thing. You do the exact thing you guys criticize them of doing. 
You can't say that you hold to the primacy of scripture when you teach that scripture can't be understood correctly without having the infallible interpreter to interpret it for you. This is the abject catch-22 that the SDA church lives with, excuse me, lives within. Because then the infallible interpreter is premier over the thing that's supposed to be supreme. It's right there. And we could look at others. You guys have published the same thing in various publications over the years, as we again have documented at AnsweringAdventism.com. Look at this. From a Sabbath school quarterly. April to June, second quarter, 1976. Issue number 324 on page 92. Look what it says, folks. This is them commenting on Ellen White's Christ object lessons from pages 133 through 4. That's what the study for this section was. Quote, how advantaged the Seventh Adventist Church is to have a modern what? Inspired interpreter of both the Old and New Testaments. Then what do they say? Surely... There is every logical reason to give the inspired interpretation top priority in arriving at our understanding of the word today, close quote. And that's really the core issue, folks. You can only understand the book of Revelation, heck, all of the Bible, with the infallible interpretation of Ellen White. But John was writing the revelation to first, second century people who didn't have her writings. Their infallible interpretation that is novel to their present truth message is what interprets the whole Bible starting in 1844. The organization insists they only believe the Bible, but when it comes to being able to understand the Bible, well, you have to have the infallible interpreter to do that. But we only believe the Bible. See the problem? Revelation 6 says nothing about denominationalism. And Satan bringing about denominations as a, as, a, as a means of introducing compromise and paganism and so on. Ted, just like the SDA church, has demonstrated they don't understand denominationalism. As we looked at, he hoists up a straw man that each denomination views themselves like the Adventist church does, as the only true church. This is false, as we looked at. All these denominations see themselves as a part of the larger universal body of believers. He claims, as the SDA church does, that denominationalism is proof that Protestants are Babylon because they're supposedly doctrinally confused and totally divided even though our confessions align on like 90% of everything, we all affirm the creeds, affirm the same God, the same gospel, have the identically same message and mission, and view ourselves as attached to the same universal body that came before us and will come after us. Compared to your movement, that's not only riddled with compromisers and pastors that don't even uphold the fundamental beliefs. They deny the investigative judgment. They deny the national Sunday law. They deny Sunday being the mark of the beast. They deny the health message and on and on and on. I mean, they don't even see how foundational all these things are to your guys' systematic theology. And that without them, the system collapses. Yet they're teaching in your pulpits. I mean, give me a break that we're Babylon. Give me a break. And yeah, I am going to get a little bit elevated. Attacking the body of Christ when it's just such a joke coming from this, this movement. Look in the mirror. Yeah, you guys need a stern speaking to. It's all kumbaya around the fire in Adventism. Everyone patting each other on the back like everything's fine. And it's not. It's not okay. It's not okay. And with tears in my eyes, I will look at you and tell you it's not okay because we care about you. It's all built on lies. It's lies. Heck, someone just this week, this week, 
sent me an orientation video from Walla Walla University where they're talking about people having multiple gender identities and the gender binary being a Western social construct. But you guys are the remnant? Yeah, okay. Please. Your own institutions are caving to the cultural mob and the zeitgeist of the day. La Sierra, the others, they're going to be following suit, I'm sure, if they haven't already. The SDA organization itself has compromised even on Ellen White's own visions and writings. Again, folks, look at it on our site. Go look at the sources. There's no defending this. You can't do the, oh, it's out of context. It's not going to work, folks. She claimed to be shown in vision that the holy kiss Paul signs off on in some of his letters was supposed to be an ordinance for the church that fell away due to Antichrist. But then in the 1960s, they're saying there's no biblical evidence of the holy kiss being a normative ordinance of practice. It was only cultural. Inadvertently calling themselves Antichrist. It's like, come on, man. Not so infallible after all, huh, folks? Adventists, we want you to come to know the truth. You're called to follow Christ wherever he leads. Regardless of the cause, it's not about being loyal to an organization. Are you willing to actually follow Christ? His voice, the voice of the shepherd is not in this organization. Yet Ellen White is supposed to be the infallible interpreter. She's supposed to be the godsend of unity that will result all of you being completely in lockstep and united across every front, exhibiting no hallmarks of Babylonian division. It's because of this that you have the remnant within the remnant type of Adventists who think only a remnant of the remnant church is even legitimate. Because the organization has supposedly been infiltrated with Jesuits, so the organization can't possibly be God's. Satan, in these people's eyes, has literally infiltrated God's church. Ted, you are kidding yourselves. Just look at the comments on my videos. The whole trope about Christians being confused while you guys aren't even united is one massive case of projection. Trying to act like this is something totally foreign to you guys, exclusive to everyone else, yet division and compromise is literally the story of the Adventist Church's history and identity. You just veil it behind present truth. It's your get-out-of-jail-free card to try and use that as a dust mop to clean up all the issues, which ironically only causes more. Protestants are far more united than the SDA Church. Again, born-again Christians do not care about denominations. 90% of the guests I've had on this platform aren't Presbyterians. So what? Big freaking deal. That's not what we're looking to for unity. The denominational name is a descriptor of certain distinctives that are foundational, that are, or, sorry, that are not foundational distinctives. They are tertiary things. Like Presbyterianism is, is specifically, it only tells you about a, a type of church governance. That has nothing to do with the gospel or God. If you're a former Adventist and you've wondered about this issue, understand that defining terms is the most important thing. Go back to where I brought up the slide about the three different uses of the word church. You can't equivocate between those. There is only one church, capital C, which is the universal body of believers in all times and places, past, present, future. Those people are found across the board in a variety of denominations. Yes, even Roman Catholicism, Orthodoxy, etc. Each Protestant denomination does not think that they are the one true church, and you have to, on some impossible expedition like Ted positioned it, undertake trying to find the right one because Satan has set up all these false ones amongst the real one as a tool of deception to try and paint the picture and bolster that Adventism is this bastion of unity. There are great non-denominational local gatherings, Baptist, Lutheran. Is the word of God and the true God and his gospel preached? Are the sacraments being lawfully administered? 
there will be born again believers in the in, in the midst of those bodies. As you grow from the spiritual milk onto the spiritual meat into the finer details, maybe you'll grow to believe that one denomination is more aligned on the secondary issues than another, and you'll make the switch. I did this myself. I was a Baptist for a number of years. Became scripturally convinced of Presbyterianism and made the switch. Did I become a Christian at that point? Of course not. Did I begin all of a sudden evangelizing all my Baptist friends from where I'd left or the guys that I do street evangelism with? No. Did the pastors and elders see me as apostatizing from the faith? Of course not. Yet in Adventism, they would. That is not what's going on with denominationalism and why they exist. Now I'm losing my voice. This went way longer than it should have. For those of you that were here the entire time, bless you. Thank you for being here. I hope this was beneficial. I know this is something that burdens so many SDAs. I'll be doing shorter videos on this specific topic in the future. Because again, I, I know that lots of people leave Adventism and they're confused on this topic. So we're going to give you the classical Protestant perspective. But do not listen to the SDA church on this area. They, they do not know what they're talking about. They are completely confused. It is all part and seen through, like everything else is, the great controversy theme. That's what drives everything. This extra biblical, unique thing that Herbert Douglas, household name in Adventism, openly stated and has said, Ministry Magazine, December 2000, the great controversy theme is the equivalent of the God particle. It is the answer to the theory of everything, and we've been given it. We did not discover it. We were given it, he says. In the great controversy theme, it informs literally everything, everything in their theology. So understand, this foundational component, totally faulty, totally faulty. They don't understand what denominations are. The one true church is the universal body of believers, all places, times, space, in uh, all, all generations. And the remnant is not specifically the SDA church. The remnant is God's people in all generations that are called out from the world. That's how that can have application to every generation. Not some special end times thing where they just write themselves into the, the narrative. But again, if you want to know more about our, our position on that, go to answeringadventism.com. You can type in the remnant up top. You can go to the end times section of the site and you can find our uh, responses and uh, sources to those sorts of things. So with that said, I just want to plug one more time. Please, folks, answeringadventism.com. There are resources, memes, videos. You can sign up for our newsletter. You can donate and a host of other things. So please make sure to check that out. Adventists, we care about you. We care about you. I'm a passionate person. It's very obvious, very clear. I'm not oblivious to that. But this is not a kumbaya around the fire type of discussion. That sort of talk happens once you come to Christ, the true Christ and his gospel. Then we do that. Right now, you need a stern message. I was there. I know how it is. I know how it is. There's no feathers being ruffled. There's a lot of silence about what people really feel, what people really think. And I'm going to shoot it to you straight because that's what I wanted when I was an SDA. The voice of the shepherd is not in the SDA organization. Period. Sorry. It's not. You need to be told that. The message and gospel of Seventh-day Adventism is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ actually changes people. When I meet somebody who, who's encountered this gospel, they know that they've encountered this gospel. That's why when people tell, I mean, I get people commenting on my videos from all across the board. You need to join the Holy Orthodox Church. You need to join the Roman, I, I get all of it. You need to come back to the SDA Church. And this isn't what I use for my apologetic when engaging with other people and defending the, the gospel of the kingdom and Jesus Christ, etc. But when it comes to me and myself, Orthodox friends, Catholic friends, you're not going to convince me through history or any sort of other uh, argumentation that this gospel is not the gospel because this gospel changed me. And you can't argue with that. You're not going to be able to change that. So I'm heralding this gospel because this gospel changes people and it can free people from serious things. 
and bring about a radical conversion and change that when you start to study the word of God, who's giving you the understanding of what all that is, union with Christ, it all, all the dots become connected. There's none of this SDA nonsense going on. There's none of this. It, it just this great controversy theme and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So Adventists, we want you to know the truth. We want you to know this gospel. Stick around with us. If you've been here from the beginning, we're at almost one year, folks. And I, then I want to get off here because it's been almost four hours. If you were here from the beginning and you're an SDA and you're still here, Seriously. Bravo. You may hate me. You may think I'm a terrible person. You may think I'm angry, I'm spiteful, etc. Still, after a year of listening. But if you're still here, I applaud you. I applaud you. Keep listening. Because ultimately, it's the word of God. It's not me that's going to do it. That's not, that's not what we think our, our goal is. We pray and seek to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by furthering his kingdom, by taking his gospel to the nations and going to this specific people group who I believe has been under uh, serviced, has been overlooked, has flown under the radar, and we have to be honest about the facts. So if you're still here after all of this, praise God, and I hope that you'll continue to listen and be challenged by this material. Thank you, folks, for being here. If you stuck around this whole time, Thank you. The fact that you'd listen to this for four hours. I hope it was beneficial. I hope that you guys were blessed by this. We will see you guys again next week where I will have Richard Foster, former Adventist, on the show to discuss and respond to Adventist pastor Dennis Preby, where we will be discussing the gospel in light of the Adventist gospel. So make sure to be here a week from, uh, well, six days, actually. It'll be next Thursday. This was an anomalous Friday night stream. So all of that said, thank you for being here. As always, until next time, God bless.